Thank you. Uh, welcome to the Vermont House Appropriations Committee. Mm -hmm. It is Monday, February 13th, 2023. And uh, we are getting started this, well, actually this afternoon. This morning, people have been working on their budgets. It was great to see so many people meeting with people <clears throat> within the building. Uh, your chair has been digging into dollars and looking at as, as much as the one-time dollars, you know tell people that we should make sure that you are looking at those one-time dollars, especially as they um, pertain to your budgets. Um, and a lot of new programs in there that we're gonna need to get some details on it. But we'll get started with, with you, sir. You have not met everyone here. No, Madam Chair, I have not. So why don't we do people... introduce ourselves before you get started? So um, I'm Representative Diane Lanferer. I live in Jens and I represent Addison Free. Hi, I'm Robin Shy from Middlebury. Pat Brennan from Colchester. Hi, Tiff Lemley from Burlington. Tristan Tolino from Brattleboro. <laughs> Carrie Dolan from Waitsfield and I represent Duxbury, Faceton, Moore Town, Waitsfield and Warren. Molly <clears throat> from Callis, Pinefield and Marshfield, where Janet. Yeah. Uh, Trevor Squirrel, Jericho and Underhill. <coughs> Woody Page from Newport. Rebecca Holcomb from Sharon Stratford, Thetford and Norwich. Good afternoon. Jim Harrison, Swiftman, Benjamin, Kellen, Clint, and it's you. Good to see you both. Representative, I didn't hear your joke, so um, oh. <laughs> oh, you should hear. I know it was a time travel joke. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around, we have others. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to believe that. I guess well, maybe it's the size of the room. And oh, oh, she's not here though. She's at the screen. Oh, oh there oh. she is. I'm sorry, Lynn, go ahead. I forgot. It's good to see Annie and John again, and uh, Lynn Dickinson from St. Albans. I have to leave early to go to a Vermont State College board meeting, but it's good to see you again. Good to see you again. And Madam Chair, before I begin, um, yeah. I have to concur with you. The Adam Project was an excellent movie. Oh, so, good. I'm yes. glad that you. Yes. Um, my name is John Campbell, uh, Executive Director for the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Uh, for the record, Annie Noonan, I'm the de uh, Department of State's Attorney and Sheriff's Labor Relations and Operations Manager. And she really is the brains behind the operation. So um, you're going to hear mostly from Annie today, who's going to walk through the budget. Um, I, I just wanted to give like an overall um, uh, presentation as to what the department is for those of you who may not be um, aware. Uh, we have uh, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, as obviously as it states, we represent the sheriff, uh, state's attorneys, um, uh, the 14 counties, of the, uh, each state's attorney in their offices. And then uh, the sheriffs, the part we represent is uh, we take care of their salary and their benefits pass through our, our office, uh, our department, and then we handle the transport deputies. Um, uh, we do not handle the, uh, the sheriff's running of their daily operations of, of their offices. Um, some people have, have you know, th uh, thought that, especially uh, recently, there's been more news about uh, some of the sheriff's departments. And so just to clarify, we just do the, um, uh, the transport deputies and the sheriffs themselves, the, uh, their salaries. Uh, we also have uh, victims advocates uh, and the uh, special investigative units are also uh, through our department. Uh, altogether, as I said, there's uh, almost 180, uh, I think there are 180 employees. Um, we, uh, right now, we're facing, especially uh, the state's attorneys really take up the major portion of our uh, representation in the department. And uh, right now, we are facing uh, a huge case backlog with uh, with, our, with all the cases due to not just the pandemic, but uh, prior to the pandemic, there was a, a backlog, but it, the, the, uh, the pandemic absolutely exacerbated it. And it uh, still has resounding um, uh, issues for us uh, as, a, uh, as a department. And the, in addition to that, uh, the cases continue to, to mount. Um, and a lot of that is because of the, uh, the backlog with us trying to be able to take care of um, cases that are older, especially ones where if somebody is incarcerated or uh, if this is something that's hanging over someone's head, you want to get get through it. You want them to be able to go on with their lives and, and uh, move on. Uh, 
so uh, the folks that we have working for us are some of the, I mean, some of the hardest working people I know. Um, they, they put in uh, countless hours. Unfortunately, you know, our states, our deputies and state's attorneys, they're, they're handling caseloads of, of like, you know, 350, 400 cases, which is, which is outrageous. I mean, it's, it's really, that's how bad it is for, um, and especially when we're trying to do more restorative justice uh, to me it, and to also the, the people that I represent. It's been extremely important for us to be able to get people to work closely with people who have, you know, made a lot of them have made mistakes, you know, made, they made bad judgment calls. And um, we don't want that to dictate what the rest of their life is going to be. So you try to help out and you try to match them up with, with programming. But when you're handling so many cases, it's hard to do that, very difficult to do that. Um, so uh, our folks are, are, are they're, they're very dedicated, but when you're dealing with that many cases, it's tough. The, the victim's advocates, uh, now those folks, uh, the men and women we have working there, some of them have upwards of uh, handling 800 cases. So, you know, for anyone to think that you're going to be able to get, you know, the, the full victim services uh, when you have 800 cases, uh, that's, it's pretty tough to do that. And, but they, they, you know, do it somehow, and luckily that you know they're not dealing with every every case at, at once. But um, it's still it's it's sad to see that um, that something so important is not you know fully uh, in in our opinion you know fully resourced. But uh, we understand that times are tough and um, you know money is short. But we we um, we do uh, find that the funding of the victims' advocates are extremely uh, important to to our offices. Um, so what we will do now is I will turn it over to Annie who will run through the individual budget and then uh, if there's any questions we'll entertain those. Oops. Well, we're on time. I'll turn my phone off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see some familiar faces and I'm glad to make points to the new folks here. Thank you. Um, so what I... Um, try to do to make life a little bit simpler as I include uh, for you this one page after each of these four of these for each each section of our budget. So our budget consists of uh, four, four lines, the state's attorneys, the sheriffs, the special investigation unit, and the victim advocates. So I can walk you through just generally and I had the opportunity, John and I and Barbara Bernardini, our fiscal manager here who um, was encouraged to come up to the table and decline, but if you have any real questions, Barbara's also a big part of the uh, brains of the operation, and John gives me the credit, and Barbara is really brains here. Um, I had the opportunity uh, with John and Barb today to meet with Representative Squirrel right before we came in, and he gave me some good feedback about some information that he thought the committee would want to see as we kind of um, refine through this, but let me give you the walkthrough as to what we're looking at. So we have four sections of our budget. Um, the largest, obviously, is the state's attorney's budget. We have about 109 uh, full-time employees. That includes the 14 state's attorneys, um, all of our administrative support staff, the victim advocates, and our deputy state's attorneys. Um, this year, the 5% increase that we received in um, the budget from the administration is primarily going to be for wage adjustment, that includes the union contract provisions, health insurance, and retirement. All of those things were going up, um, and that's pretty much where that money is going to go. Um, we will have to carry about $232,000 in vacancy savings, which doesn't sound like a lot unless you consider the fact that that's probably three positions at least that won't be able to get filled during the fiscal year until we meet those, meet that vacancy saving. Um, some good news I'd like to report on is uh, ARPA money that, and I know that that's, this is just a small diversion, but this legislature gave us um, um, uh, ARPA money to transition our criminal case management system. That was really necessary to do to kind of keep up with the courts um, who implemented a better system and, and, and we wanted to be able to integrate and talk to that. So that pro pro uh, progress on that um, project is going very well, and um, that is our money that is still in our bucket, so to speak, and we're really pleased with the work that was done, and ADS has been extremely helpful in terms of helping us along with that, as has a, the contractor Barry Dunn, um, is just doing the project management. We hopefully soon will have a contract for work to be done within about two months. Um, the restarting of the trials, um, obviously, it was like the floodgates are opening. 
there's lots of work that has to get done around that, um, and our attorneys are working as hard as they can. The ask in this budget is sort of really two things in terms of state's attorneys, maybe three, but let me go to the one. I feel like as though we need additional positions uh, across the board. So it's not just attorneys, but it's victim advocates and administrative support staff. Now, one of the things that Representative Squirrel has asked me to do is to lay it out a little bit more clearly as to what we would be looking for. For example, at the bottom of this page, I say, for, you know, looking at it sort of very um, simply, I was, you know, we were looking at, well, maybe one additional attorney, one additional victim advocate, and one additional administrative support staff. But the reality is that it isn't necessarily uh, true that every office would need one of those. Not everyone needs a full-time attorney. Not everyone needs a full-time victim advocate. So what um, what I um, have committed is that I would go back and kind of do a more of a more of an actual plan as to how we would use use additional positions and what why why they would be needed. So for example, Chittenden County being one of the largest um, uh, field offices. Um, probably isn't necessarily an office that needs an additional attorney. They're, they've, been, they've been staffed well over the years. But Franklin County, Washington County, Rutland County, Wyndham County, some of those offices are struggling mightily under the, the weight of their work. Um, the other issue that I would say is um, you, this legislature had given us originally the $3.3 in in ARPA money, which was then administration had converted it into general fund, and we put it in, it was able to put into a one-time bucket, and we are spending that down. Um, we would like to be able to be in a position of being able to more effectively spend that, but as you have the money, you have to also get the positions out of the, with the Department of Human Resources. So um, we really, uh, limited service is really the more, more attractive way to recruit people. Right now, we're writing letters uh, because that money can expire at the end of each June. It can carry forward as it did last year. But one of the things that happens is you have to ask for it. So at the end of the year, because it's general fund money, you've got to say, can we, can we carry it forward? And so as we are hiring, for example, deputy state's attorneys as limited service, their letters now say, um, you know, your start date will be January 15th. Make that up. Um, and uh, with, a, with a potential terminate, a separation date of June 17th, unless we get, unless uh, money is available to, for us to use to continue your position. So that's a really, that's kind of a buzzkill when you're looking at deciding whether you want to keep, a, you want to take a position. And we're, we're, we're giving you a position for a few months or six months and other places are hiring full time. We're competing just like everybody else for, for employees every, all over the state. So we have to really, realistically, we have to say that because that money could be taken back. We hope it won't be. We've talked to Commissioner Gresham um, and um, Deputy Commissioner Merrill about that, and I think they hear us, and they did last year. I know this committee heard us and was very supportive of us carrying that money forward because you gave it to us to clear the backlog, or um, as Representative Squirrel said, um, you know, the, uh, work on work on the court the court issues. I think we're doing a good job, but it's tough to recruit people as temps when they get no benefits and limited service when you got when you've got we've got to put it in the letter honestly to say June seventeenth maybe you'll stay. So, go ahead. Great, thanks. So just to clarify, you're talking about some permanent positions and you're talking about some limited service positions, and if. Am I reading this correctly, that you are looking for possibly 42 more permanent positions? Correct. Correct. But, but as Representative Squirrel and I talked at lunch, that perhaps we can present a, a plan that would lay it out against maybe the backlog reducing. Okay. And then the limited service positions, and I, I totally understand about, you know, why do you take a job that could be gone in a year or something. Um, do you have a specific number of those in mind? Um, I think, well, all we hired, we, we were authorized to hire 10 attorneys as limited service, and everything else was temps. Uh, t six paralegal temps and, and 16 administrative support staff as temps. And we're just, those have been tough to fill because they have, as temps, they get no benefits. Um, and they have a, a cap of 1,280 hours that they can work. So that's, yeah. that's also challenging too. 
So 16 temps or 26 temps? We had uh, 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 22 temps okay. and 10 limited service. Oh, okay. That you were authorized last year? Yes, it was, there was, uh, most of them were still authorized. So you're not asking for, or are you asking for more on top of that? Well, in order to spend the money effectively, because we still have um, money left from a fair amount of that. I think of the 3.3, we we've probably spent 1.4, 1.5. So we still have a fair amount of that money we could put towards moving this along, moving the, moving the backlog along. Um, so a combination, and I think that that was the plan that I, I committed to Representative Squirrel that I would bring back a more firm plan, X numbers of temps, or I mean X number of limited service, X numbers of permanent. Okay, and then the, the 42 permanent, somewhere you'll tell us with all that costs. Yes. It's sounding expensive. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Question. So more of a generic question. I mean, everybody's concerned about the backlog that the pandemic caused. Where are you today? Are we keeping it? I mean, are we gaining on the backlog? Are we still losing ground? Uh, or are we just status quo? We haven't really... The, it, it all depends on... Uh, we are, I think we are uh, making progress on the, on the backlog, but it's not as you know, fast as... It's not something you just do, you know, a magic bullet. Uh, the... Uh, there are uh, some counties that we've asked uh, that, uh, for instance, Rutland County had, I think, three, almost 3,800 cases backlog. Uh, uh, backlog. Um, I don't. If you tried them every day, you know, if you had a trial every day, that's not going to. You're not going to do much with that. So what we've been doing is trying to go through finding some of these older cases that might be able to be dismissed. And um, we just reduced the, the new attorney, uh, state's attorney in, in Rutland County. Uh, we're proud to announce that he uh, reduced it by 20% already uh, since being in there. But we still need, a lot of those are still going to require, you know, the cases that be moved to where you have interaction with the lawyers, you know, to either try the cases or push them towards trial and then work out some type of plea agreement. The problem is that as I mentioned earlier, is that the cases aren't stopping coming in. So there we're dealing with these uh, acute matters um, and then to try to get them to go back and look into the backlog, it's, it's, just, it's just really tough. So we need some folks that are going to be dedicated you know, solely to you know, dealing with backlogs in the offices. And that's, that's been really tough. Um, and it's not just us. I mean, this is something that, that you, I mean, you're going to hear from the Defender General and also the courts, because mm -hmm. it, we don't, we don't want to operate in a vacuum, so that the, you know, these folks are going to have to, um, we're all going to have to be in this together. And I must say is that I think we've had a really good relationship uh, with the court and with the Defender General's office in trying to you know, uh, discuss and, and work ways that we can um, solve this backlog. But it is, it is crucial. Well, and, and related to that, if, if we were to give you the positions that you have the money for, can you even find the lawyers to fill those positions? And that is a very difficult thing because, um, unfortunately, we're looking at, you know, this is not the same pay as you would get in, in private practice. Um, in fact, I right before I came here, I, I read two articles where uh, New York uh, and uh, Florida were also facing the exact same problems with, you know, trying to recruit. Uh, Florida, actually, the legislature just went and uh, appropriated uh, 15, 000, basically a $15,000 signing bonus on for, you know, for attorneys to go to work for. Um, I'm go Don't leave us. No, I was just <laughs> 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 I'll be it's, right. it's starting to look good. We got yeah, to get some work done. I'm telling you. <laughs> Sorry, Florida. Yeah, yeah no. it doesn't do it. Yeah, yeah. concrete jungle. Um, anyway, the, the point being is that it, you know, trying to get them and then the other, the other issue is trying to follow, uh, fill some of these spots is that if you bring somebody in from out of state, um, they still have to go through all the licensing to get here and to get their bar numbers. So <laughs> they need a house. Yeah, so that's <laughs> delaying. Yeah, so. But I will say that um, we are in our second con full contract with um, union contract with with the staffs in the state's attorney's office, and I feel like that has made a difference in terms of us being able to better take care of our, of our staff. 
Um, our administrative staff um, have had two upgrades in the past three years, um, and I think that that's, and that's been very helpful. Our um, state's attorneys, we are, um, uh, we went back and we took a look at anybody who perhaps did not get any prior service credits or credit for their prior, for their ex relevant experience, and we, through the union negotiations, we were able to take care of that. I want to say it was pay equity, and it really was in some cases, but the reality is, is we worked collaboratively with the union. We took care of all of that. They were very pleased about that, and we're doing a much better, I think if the word is out there that we're doing much, much better in terms of taking care of our own, our own staff in this well, regard. Yeah, one other thing, though, I think it, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is that, you know, each year when the legislature comes, obviously they come up with new laws. And um, over the past couple of years, there have been several new laws that have really uh, caused additional um, uh, impact and created an additional impact on, on us and we, we got some of the positions obviously when expungements came through there was um, some uh, there was appropriation there but they're exploding I mean to the point where we you know you're, you're getting more and more and more and they're I, it's not that they're complicated they do take quite a bit of time they're not as some people say oh it should only be 15 minutes a piece which takes far longer than that um, but we're, we're also finding that we're having a lot of uh, additional problems later on because some of the people who get any records expunged are now coming back and saying, well, we need our records because we are getting licensed to do this. And then we just have to say the records don't exist because they don't. And so our people are getting tied. We have a couple of cases dealing with that. Um, uh, that and then uh, public records requests have just gone through the, the, the absolute roof. Um, Tim Dumont, who's our new, um, we, just, we just brought him on, um, an Addison County native. And uh, yeah. Tim's doing a great job, but he's been absolutely barrel under, with, with the uh, public, uh, public um, records request to the point where he's working till like 10 to 11 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, just trying to handle them and redacting all of the information that needs to be redacted. And so things just aren't getting simpler, let's just say. So I don't mean to totally stop you. Thought it was good breath. Representative Mahali had a question, and then I've got just a clarifying question to ask. Her. Yeah, just help me out here. Um, so the 42 permanent positions. That's that's a denominator against the or a numerator against the denominator of how many? I mean, what's the permanent staff size of? The permanent staff size in the state's attorneys is 109. We have 14 offices, and this was really honestly overly simplified. It was a one one additional position yeah, yeah. for each office. One additional attorney, one additional victim advocate, but, but one that, additional is that one oh nine? In other words, it's forty two. Let's let's just take the fourteen deputy states attorneys. Yeah. How many deputy states attorneys are there? Now? That's that's sixty two. Okay, so it's fourteen over sixty. All right. And I guess the other question I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from you is if this is a backlog, these are being hired to address a backlog, why are they permanent positions? Why aren't they temporary positions? Because presumably, at some point, we're going to be through the backlog, although it might be a while. They, they may be retiring by the time the backlog is done. I mean, I, I hate, I, again, I, I, I hate to say this, but backlog is not something that's going to go away overnight. And, um, you know, people have looked and They'll come up and they'll say, well, "Why don't you just take off, you know, like knock off, you know, twenty percent of the cases?" Well, we were fortunate in this one county to do that because he went through. He was able to go through and to see, you know, nonviolent crimes. People were, you know, crimes uh, cases where there was not a victim, but there's always that victim because you got a business. Uh, Jim Harrison, you know, from your former position, uh, retail theft is, is is just knocking businesses out of business right and left. Uh, so it's hard for us to do it. There's people who say, why don't you just take all the fish and game violations and just do away with them. Well, that's okay for some places, but you know, if you're in the Northeast Kingdom or if you're in some other spots that feel like those are really serious issues that we as a constituency feel are important, you don't want to see that happen. So, um, but the biggest thing is, is the fact that there are um, we are finding that the, a lot of the, the names of the uh, defendants, let's say, um, 
you're seeing the same ones over and over on many of the dockets, and you're seeing you know generational issues, um, which is is kind of tells it's a telling story, um, unfortunately. And so it's not as simple as just going in there and dismissing a case um, and trying to get a trial uh, going forward and, and asking. Um, you know, there's times when let's say the prosecutor say, "Fine, judge, we're ready for trial." As you know, the attorneys here will know. And then you'll have the defense say, well, Your Honor, I need a continuance because of this. Um, there's discovery issues, you know, that, that, that because a lot of people during, you know, the pandemic, uh, they used to sort of, everybody was sort of wait and see, like, well, why should I settle my case right now if I don't know what's going to happen, I mean, if, if, if you can't get back into court? So there's a, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's so many variables to this one issue that, that I can tell you I just do not see that the that the backlog problem, unless we address it, unless you all address it, uh, help us address it, not just us, but also the court and defender general, um, it's going to be um, it's going to be with us for a while. To the point where I, I was I was kind of kidding about saying that they'll probably retire by the time, but who knows? So I think my my question too was around that same thing. It was okay? There's your the 42 positions, the, the one 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 somebody. Okay, you're going to come back with a plan on that. I will. But the 32 that, that are the 10 attorneys and the 22 temps are outside of that, obviously. Correct. Okay, and they're part of the 3.3 million from last. And so there's enough to pay for them another year. Yes, there is. Okay, so for 24, and they're dealing. They're here to help with the backlog, right? Correct. So it'll be 25 when we need to really address that gap as well, right? Am I seeing that? Because it, <clears throat> you're going to. I, I, that is, I think, correct, but if I can, but um, the number you just cited, which were the 10, 10, 10 attorneys and the 22, which are paralegals and, and admin temps. Um, um, our issue right now is just we really could need, we could use more positions. I know that sounds sounds counterintuitive because it's hard to fill these, but if we had more limited service, uh, at, uh, I think Representative Squirrel said that to me, would, you know, they, they're easier to fill if they're limited service. Absolutely, because they have some benefits. Right now, the vast majority of what we would receive were temps, and that those are tough to fill. And and so, if you could add also, I think, what Representative Squirrel had told us today, because you were under the impression that those temps should have been limited service, I think. So you'd like so to convert right. some of that conversation, those 10 and the 22? There's some research I still need to do okay. on this, because when we were having a conversation this morning, I learned something that I assume is different. Well, well, that's why we all and come to work. Kind of yeah, and I don't want us to testify something <coughs> yeah. that's not accurate. It was my so. assumption that when they made them all temporary, when we passed the court reopening piece, that we converted them all to limited service. That was the that's the information I got from mm -hmm. that. And, so. and I want to make sure that in my mind, I don't think, oh, 32 are already there, 42, you just need really 10 more. That's not right. true. You right. need the 32 for this and 42. And, and, and um, Madam Chair, again, yeah. we'll come back with, okay. with a, a more specific thing. I, and I apologize I, that we didn't have it yeah. right here now, but um, things are just, you know. Everything's in development. Yeah. It's all alive. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. 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 All right. So that's essentially state's attorney. If we can move on, if you want to try to grab your sheet on the sheriff's, I believe that's the next one. So there is a mistake on that sheet. I listed that, that the increase for the FY24 was 2.9. Oh, I'm sorry. What, what age is uh, that would be, age? that's, um, okay. Well, years are not passing. So if you go to the next section that starts with a. Yeah. Okay. It looks like about page 30, Mark. 30? Thank well, you. Well, it's 22, then we're at 115. Okay. Share. Yeah. Share. Three pages in, you should find it. Got there you go. Okay, great. So I had listed it was 2.9, and I apologize. It's actually 4.8. I didn't mean to make that mistake, but I did. Um, well, I'm sorry. On the crosswalk, it's 4.8? Yes. yes. 
Yeah, that's correct. That is correct, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay. So all of the money in this budget um, for the sheriffs is general fund, state general fund money. As John said, it pays the uh, salary and benefits for the 14 elected state uh, sheriffs and the state transport deputies. And I'll just refer to them as state deputies. Those are the folks who move people, um, pick people up at the facilities and bring them for their court hearings, and they assist in other, a variety of other activities. Um, the interesting thing uh, is that there is just a tremendous request for more assistance, not less, from our, our transport deputies. They're doing a lot of work with the judiciary in terms of support security and with human services, monitoring juveniles that need supervision um, before they find a placement for the kids. Um, they're, we're getting requests for assistance to OCS for child support um, and a recent request even from DOL on some civil process issues. The, and if I could just interject for a second. The, again, our, the state transport deputies, they are statutorily just assigned to um, transported prisoners or um, juveniles or, you know, for also folks who are, have um, issue with the uh, mental health, department of mental health. But because there are so many other problems that are existing out there right now with other departments and agencies, whether it be AHS or DOC, um, they're asking for things that we've never done before. And as Annie just pointed out, with even the Office of Child Support, they're asking us to, to help enforce child support. And which, and I'll throw it back to you. So, um, and so it's just sort of an interesting situation because as the conversation is occurring about, you know, what's the future for the sheriff's departments, I just want to point out that um, there's an awful lot of work that's being done by not only our folks, but the sheriff's others, that what I would call their per diems, but they actually work for the sheriff, not for the state. There's a tremendous amount of work that's being done in rural policing in Vermont and other work that gets done by the, by the sheriffs. But our folks primarily um, are doing the transports and doing all these other services. We're trying to really help the judiciary. We've been very much supporting the judiciary and human services for the past few years, particularly. Um, you probably remember that we talked about that, you know, Sheriff Marcou out of Memorial County was uh, supporting um, the motel program folks, the, the motel owners said, yes, we will set these up as homeless facilities, um, you know, let, let folks stay here, but we want some assistance on security. And that was all being done by the sheriffs. So, um, so right, but not paid by through the state, well, paid by a contract with the well, hotel. Well, a contract, okay. yes, um, but, but during the pandemic years, it was we, all one. we were letting our transport deputies, who at the time were not doing a lot of transports because everything was remote, Although they were moving them up to remote hearings, so that, that was occurring, and we were moving people back. They, we allowed them to do a lot of other things. They were doing uh, transports from facility to facility, and we were, they were doing more work with human services. There was a lot of assistance to human services during that period of time. So I'm looking at your crosswalk, and the, the transport is down. The Trans mileage is down 30,000, and I'm going to assume, which is never a good thing, that, that has a lot to do with the fact that there's more remote hearings? That's correct. Okay, so there's less we transport going on from prisoners. And and if we heard earlier in a budget adjustment, the judiciary looking for support, which this committee and the House provided, it's over in the Senate right now, for the judiciary's IT to help, um, and I'm not going to get this right, basically, uh, some of the remote hearings, the, the ability to have a soundproof room so that it wasn't, is, is in the BAA, right, Representative yeah. Squirrel? So some of that will even help more so. Right. We felt pretty confident that the reduction in the mileage would not come back and bite us um, for this upcoming budget because year. Because Because they continue to have some of the remote process. Right. And I think that that has actually worked really well because if you think about the fact that the even for corrections, if they have to get someone ready to leave the facility, there's a lot of work that has to be done by the correctional officers. And then when the person comes back in, there's a lot of check-in work that has to be done. Uh, so there, that's that's been somewhat of a relief even for DOC. That they right. don't and they have to stay with the person. Stay. They have to stay with the prisoner 
wall well, here. once there, they right? give them, no, one, once they give them to us to move over to a like. <coughs> if they get them ready to no, go. I meant the sheriff stay with them. We stay with them the stay with in them. the courtroom, so, so it's additional it's security in the courtroom, too. Because all but two of our transport deputies are level three. That's the highest level certification for law enforcement. All but two are level three certified, and only two of them are level two. So there is a tremendous amount of assistance to, you know, the judges and the, de and the defendants and everybody in the courtroom. There's a couple of people standing around who are level three certified and can help in the event of an emergency. And um, there's one sheriff for every county? Yes. Is, so 14? There are 14 elected, elected sheriffs. There are uh, approximately 22 transport deputies. Um, and 22 transport 22, deputies. 23 or so. Um, and we're working with human services to see if we can give them some additional assistance. The one thing I will mention in, um, is that Last year, the legislature allowed the transport, state transport deputies to unionize. Um, we have yeah. not yet started bargaining. Um, the SEA just contacted me recently. I sent them a data dump, wages, salaries, benefits, all that stuff. And um, our first conversation on that is on Wednesday. I'm hopeful that we will have a speedy <coughs> resolution to the contract negotiations. Our first two contracts with the state's attorney's offices resolved in about four or five meetings. No mediation. We were just able to collaboratively resolve a contract, which was great. I'm hoping that we have the same the same process with going forward with the sheriffs. And they also are unionized under the SCA. And so, I know for here, this is the budget. But I'm, you know, just for those that might be paying attention, why are we not talking about the other? I know that you've been over to government ops around some of the issues other issues around what's happening, not just one, but statewide when it comes to sheriffs, and that's extremely unfortunate. But, uh, yeah. but across the hall is having those Correct. hearings, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so if we, you know, if we wind up with un unanticipated costs as a result of the union, union contract or more assistance from other agencies, we could wind up in a situation where we run out, we back a budget adjustment for mileage and per diem. We've never had to do that, so we're keeping our fingers crossed that we manage this budget pretty well. Um, and I think we're working very well with the, sh with the sheriffs and getting them to be fully engaged to support state government. I think that that's been a, key, a goal for us, and I think that's really occurring. Okay, any questions Thank for the sheriffs? All right, next would be, next I believe is the victim advocates. On the victim advocates, yep. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, 27 victim advocates um, that work across state government in state's attorney's offices. Um, they provide uh, victim support and assistance um, that for everything from explaining the court process, making sure people know, the victims know what's happening because it's a really complicated situation. And for, for people who are not familiar with the criminal justice system, they assist with um, making sure they know all about victim comp and victim restitution and other services. You know, there's a lot of communities, in, not in all areas, but in a lot of areas of the state, there's good resources for victims, and so they are really in tune with all of the support system in the, in the communities. They make sure that the victims know about what's available to them. Um, but they, it's, there's a lot of um, making sure that they are fully aware uh, victim statement uh, to the judge, all of that. Um, so our victim advocates are really, as John said, are very engaged. They, if you think about the fact that an office might have five full-time or six full-time attorneys who all have, the, John, as John mentioned, 350, 400 cases, and you have two victim advocates. Mm -hmm. So figure that one out. They've all, a lot of those cases have victims um, who want to know what's happening. So our victim advocates have a pretty, pretty heavy workload. Um, they do a great job. Um, this was the first year for this line item in our budget. Um, for, I'm sorry, yes, FY23, because we were funded by federal money, as you might recall, this committee would probably recall that conversation. We were oh, funded right. by federal money, and then um, um, 
CCBS requested state general fund, the state general fund came to us. So we feel like um, we're hoping, we're keeping our fingers crossed that we're going to end up this fiscal year being able to make sure all the bills are paid around the victim advocate program, um, but not sure exactly. And if we have a problem, we will let you know at budget adjustment. Budget adjustment. <coughs> Is that, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, what, why the change from federal funding to state funding? So the, uh, the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, CCDS, um, for uh, a number of years, for folks here who might remember the prior director, Chris Benno, um, and then um, uh, she had approached the legislature and the administration about uh, saying, we would like the program to be funded by state money. What's the advantage of, of that? I, you know, I don't want to speak for them. I think... Okay, well, I, and I can take it offline, too, if that is helpful. It just seems to me if you've got some federal dollars available, you know, we, we split it. Uh, Okay. Representative Squirrel, did you? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the Crime Victim Services and the federal funding coming through POLCA, which is the Victims of Crime Act. Oh, victims of Crime Act, POLCA. And, uh, and we, based on the testimony we heard last week, just for new folks, but folks that have been around know that they're driven very much so by special funds and they've been declining. <coughs> and the Victims Advocate Program that's in the state's attorney's office is funded from the Crime Victim Services Special Fund, which is the bulk of fund. So the thought process is rather than just changing it to general fund and giving it to Crime Victim Services to have to give it to state's attorneys just doing the whole thing, funding with the program state's attorneys. <coughs> make it general fund. That way, the bulk of money could help offset the funding shortfalls across all the special funds that they were experiencing. So that they wouldn't have to keep coming back to us. So there's not back, less their special yeah. It's not okay. less federal dollars. We're not leaving something on the table. Exactly. We just, we just okay. shift it. Okay. But that's what I did that same, but yeah. thank okay. you Trevor. I should know that. But I, I will point out, and we've had this conversation, that there's no personal services increase in this budget, and I, I question that. Right. Yeah. We we'll only need to have a conversation with, with Adam, I think, about, right. about why it's, that is. It it's down 2.6 in the, yeah, <coughs> right? Is that the, the other personal services? Is that what you're... Yeah, what is the, that's all my question is. Okay. The same. Well, what is the down 2.562? I see it's level for the salaries are level funded, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to ask them to speak to the crosswalk and why it's oh, okay. set up that way. But, uh, but the reality is there's no, no personal services increase. In it's program. like 68, exactly. Level funded. So it's really, oh, go ahead. if I'm correct, Barb, I'm just, it's really was just a, a, a budget line shift, was it not, Barb? Uh, Come on, can you, this is Barbara Bernadine. Oh, from other um, personal services to salaries and benefits? Yes, because this is actually the first budget written for our department. Last year it was switched during the fiscal year. So the down was last year's. 22s? 20, 23, FY23? 23. So basically what we received in the budget was salary and benefit not, mm -hmm. not, and nothing else. But as Representative Squirrel pointed out, we don't have it doesn't account for what we know is coming forward for the for the increase. We have a two percent across the board July increase coming uh, through the union contract and a thousand dollar non recurring bonus, which is lines up exactly to what the executive branch did also. So that's not in here, um, and it needs to be. Yeah. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They just didn't put it in. Didn't they? It wasn't, it wasn't put in? I mean, is that, is that this? It wasn't in our target. This wasn't given to us as a target. So, um, so we need to go back and yeah. get some of that in, well, instituted in. Okay. So when you, when I see on your sheet for this, uh, funding for FY24 will not cover costs of union contract provisions for Correct. victim advocates. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. There's no money in, there was no money allocated. Okay. In but you did allocate it in the previous budget for the. Well. You yes. said it was in there. It's you know what you anticipated. Yes, yes. 
So we do need to go back and get the 20, the 24 budget fixed because it doesn't include what's coming forward yeah. for next year for the contract. So we don't actually have the right numbers. Correct. Okay, and then those will come in through Representative Squirrel. This is your budget, so you're gonna yeah. monitor what the funding for FY24 should be that's not here. Mm -hmm. Which would, which would, you know, stay within the three, well, some of the other agencies in government were trying to stay at 3%, but some of them are at 8 Some of the last. Yeah. If I, I can just make a, three. just one follow-up to Representative Harrison's comment. So we, uh, so our department um, did not initiate the conversation to have the federal money substituted with the state general fund. That was CCBS. Um, so, we were one of, at the time, I believe, 41 sub-recipients of the VOCA money. Um, and as um, Representative Squirrel pointed out, that VOCA money for, has been going down. And I, there, was a, there was actually a report that was done by Joint Fiscal Office to kind of give you those numbers. So, to the extent that um, it has been a challenge, um, I think, to project ahead you know, victim services and victim advocate services on federal money, I think that that was probably the impetus for CCBS to seek the state general fund dollars. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember the conversation yeah. and the shortfalls and the yeah. funds. So sometimes it just, I need yep. to hear it two or three times. And yeah. Me too. Because I'm vaguely remembering something of this, Annie, that, that way back from when I was on before, I didn't have this budget, but but there was a conversation around the, you know, like question of what are we going to do because this source is shrinking, shrinking every year. Right. And that was back, I think there was a report back in like 2015, maybe. Yeah. 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 Anyway. And I think Squirrel will bring us a number. We'll see what we can do. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some pieces that need to get fixed here. Okay. Yeah. Did, did uh, the administration, do, but give you your numbers, you know, the, the feedback fairly soon, or like I'm just wondering how come it came back so late for you. So um, there have there was a conversation about the victim advocate program and the and the money. Um, I think we need to go back and have the conversation again. Okay. It's always good. <coughs> All right. Okay. Any other questions on this, Representative Dolan? Uh, good afternoon. I just want to um, thank you for all this work. The, the Victim Advocate Program is exceptional. I know for, for a fact a number of my constituents have been able to take advantage of the program, and I, I thank you for this, this hard work. Yeah, we're really proud of the work of all the staff and the Victim Advocates. Um, you know, they take, like, like all of our staff, but the Victim Advocates, uh, I think, you know, they take calls, nights, weekends, and. They put the heart and soul Yeah, they really, things. really do. Okay, and then the last piece, again, if I can move you forward to the next sort of special sheet, is the Special Investigation Unit. Um, so what this, this is in our budget, but it, other than the fact that there's one staff person who is not a state employee, never has been, it's been a contract position for a million years, it's the Grant Administrative Program, SIU Grant Pro grant program administrator manager. That's Pam Hango. She took over for Mark Mateer, who I think a lot of people remember Mark for years. Um, and Pam, um, so uh, Pam works with all the SIUs. There are 12 special investigation units across the state, not, not one in every county, but I think uh, Grand Isle County works with Franklin and Essex works with Orleans. So there are 12 SIUs. Um, the money, uh, there's a grant manager position, and that's what the 62,000 is. And other than that, all that money goes out the door to support the SIUs. And it, there are two types of grants. There's program support and law enforcement. And the program support would be for the um, SIU um, local administrator, the, 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 um, um, maybe, maybe the person who's uh, uh, the program director at the local level, may in fact have a forensic interviewer. Um, uh, they may have that skill set and do both. Um, they, so usually it's, so there's program support money. It can help with rent, 
It can help with um, supplies and equipment, and it can help with salary for the admin support for the program. <coughs> and then the law enforcement grants are also given to each of the SIU, and then they, dis they work with local law enforcement, usually to have um, a reimbursement, so to speak, for support from the law enforcement agency. Um, so, for example, they might, um, they might contract with a, a municipal uh, they, or a sheriff to provide <coughs> law enforcement support to the SIU. So they tell us what they need. Um, we, they propose a budget. Um, and generally speaking, the law enforcement grants are a total about 120000 sometimes a little bit more, depending upon if there's uh, money that's able to be reverted back and we can give it back out again. And the program supports are usually in the, in the realm of about <coughs> Uh, usually about about the same. So we are a little actually probably um, um, the program supports are are are. are a, a, I'm looking at Barb twice a year. Twice a year. So um, the biggest challenge that they have, we're not worried about the money. We think that that's working okay. The biggest challenge that the SIUs have SIUs have right now are finding law enforcement people to to be able to work the units. Because as the law enforcement agencies are themselves um, challenged with staffing, they don't want to dedicate someone to the SIU necessarily. So if we can contract for an actual person, that's even best. If we can actually say we will, we will buy, you know, the, all of the time of your deputy sheriff, of your um, municipal officer, we will purchase that, and then they are dedicated to us. But. Um, uh, you know, it's really challenging. I mean, VSP has been a great support to this program. Um, the sheriffs have been a really good support in the municipals. They've all been very helpful, but like, even, you know, um, state police have had to pull back because they've, you know, right. for full-time folks. That's just what we're seeing. This is no different. Their big challenge is not the money. Their big challenge is bodies. And you have to be um, level three to investigate sex crimes. So again, these are some of the worst crimes where we're dealing with sexual assault and uh, crimes of uh, serious child abuse. So they are, I yep. consider to be some of the most critical uh, investigations going on in the state. So there's one employee that grants out to the 12 SIUs, yep. and those 12 uh, special investigation units are made up from law enforcement across the state that 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 get an average of about $120,000 a year to be a part of it. And then there's another program support. Did I? I mean, so I program support for administrative, rent, equipment, okay. and then the law enforcement grants. Okay. Separate, yeah. And the other grant. So, yeah. so they're not, there's no issue with the money or issue it's there. It's just, just that staffing. municipalities, law enforcement, and other people are not, don't have the numbers to be able to be, have right. a dedicated piece to this. Right. But it's critical that we have. Yeah. There is some really good forensic interviewing training that mm -hmm. we support through this grant for um, law enforcement and social workers and a whole bunch of people that deal with these issues, uh, kind of crosswalk yeah. of, of, of um, state agencies and federal, you know, state and, and local agencies. So forensic interviewing is really critical in this because you just can't go in and start talking to a kid who's been abused. Yeah, it's highly specialized. Yes. And if it's you don't have it, then you have a, a very good chance of losing your case yeah. or not being able to build one to begin with. So. Yeah. Yeah. Or re-victimizing a kid who's just been abused. Right. Yeah. So you have to be very careful. So the forensic interviewing piece is really critical here. But there's the, the good news is there's no there's no ask there. It's just a, just to share with you what's going on. We just always want to tell you when you're not asking for something. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So our time we've got two minutes with you. Any other final questions? And if not, we'll filter our questions and we'll get more information uh, from you on, on on other numbers from Representative Squirrel as he continues to work on. He's got a large portfolio. He's and, um, Madam Chair, if I could apologize again to yes. you and to the committee for not uh, having this with the victim's advocate, you know, not having that specific um, numbers there or how they're set out. I appreciate you coming in. We're trying really hard to get everybody in before the end of next week so that we've got the big picture before we 
make any types of decision. And as you know, having people come in and tell us what's going on is how we find out things that we don't find out from just looking at the paper. So you can adjourn in three weeks? You know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I can do it by Friday if you just let me leave. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow, sir, they won't leave me alone with it. Well, thank you very much, uh, and welcome to the new folks. And I, I can tell you, after having 16 years of sitting where you all are sitting, I can tell you you're going to have a great time while you're, while you're here. So and you've got a great chair. Mm -hmm. so great people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. When he was the senator, when I worked at the health department, it was, it was senator um, when I had to go into Sears' room. I think he was vice chair at the time, and it was really funny. I thought, <laughs> Senator Cameron. Is that what this is? Well, there's three of them in here, right? There will be two or five on this. On that, yeah, but the bigger sheet. All right, we won't move, right? We're all going to stay, stay put. Let's check. Ethics Commission. Are you? Come on, then. When you get when you get comfy. We're still live. Thank you for the handout. And are you Christina? Yes, I am. All right. Christina, I don't think that you have met our committee or us you yet. You haven't been in. I uh, know. I was here last year um, when everything was remote. But so. everything is so different yes. now. Okay. And so many people are here. So why don't we... We've got a couple holes right now because people are off meeting with budgets and things. But uh, we'll go around and introduce ourselves before you start to. So I'm, I'm Representative Diane Lampert. I live in Virgins and I represent Addison 3. Hi, Robin Shai from Middlebury. Nice to see you. Pat Brennan from Colchester. Tiff Lonely from Burlington. Tristan Tolino from Burlington. Harry Dillon from Waitsfield and I represent Duxbury Face to North Town, Waitsfield and Warren. Carol, do, do Lynn is in Representative Dickinson is from St. Albans. She's at a meeting. Yeah. I'm Martin Holly <coughs> from Dallas Marshfield. What do you think from the report? Would you skip over? Representative Squirrel. I thought I'd leave it to our chair. <laughs> it's a go are, are you done? Absolutely. Okay. Do you want to do yes. This? Uh, this is Rebecca Holcomb. And she's from Norwich and a bunch of other towns. Um, I'm Jim Harrison, Chittenden, Menden, Killington, and Gibbsfield. Yes. And for the record, start off and tell us about Yes. And I'm Christina Severett, and I'm the Executive Director of the Ethics Commission. And I'm from Barrie. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> Good. All right. Tell us about your budget. Budget, sure. So I can just start with maybe a quick overview of the Ethics Commission. So primarily we provide services. Um, we provide services to two categories of folks. So one is State of Vermont Public Services and uh, State of Vermont Public Servants and members of the general public. So for State of Vermont Public Services, um, we offer um, services related to ethics guidance and advisory opinions. So ethics guidance is when anyone who wants to, who works for the State of Vermont or um, also some categories of volunteers, can call us up with a question about ethics. Um, at the moment, we're really focused on the new code of ethics and providing advice around that. Um, and as for confidential guidance, that can be verbal, over the phone, they can tell us their name, they can tell, they don't have to tell us their name, um, they can ask for something in writing, not something in writing, and then we offer advisory opinions, which are more involved. Um, the entire commission reviews an advisory opinion, and those are a bit more time consuming, but those are for more complicated questions. And those are um, posted on our website so that anyone can see them after uh, personally identifying information has been redacted. And we also um, uh, receive complaints, and those can come from State of Vermont Public Service and also members of the public. So we don't have investigatory authority or enforcement authority, um, but what we do is we receive the complaint, we review it to make sure it actually implicates an, uh, an issue related to ethics, and then we forward it on to an entity that can handle the investigation and do further reviews. So that could be DHR, that could be the Attorney General's office, that could be one of the ethics panels in the House or Senate. Oh, go ahead. Um, 
don't complain. No, I'm not complaining. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to double that number. Um, I could, but um, help, help me out. I, I, I realize you don't have enforcement, um, and I know that's been a discussion in this building uh, from time to time, but you have three complaints. You, assuming they're, you look at them and you, they sound legit, you refer it to, like if it was one of us, you would refer it to the legislature, right? Yes. Um, if it's um, a state employee in the executive branch, for example, who would you refer it to? That would go to the Commissioner of Human Resources. Okay. And something similar if it was judiciary. Um, Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, yeah. Do you have any follow-up on those three complaints as to what happened to them? Sure. I can backtrack a little bit. So um, we have three formal complaints that were actually filed with us, written complaints. And so one related to municipal ethics, so it was closed upon receipt. We really encourage people to call us if they're thinking about filing a complaint to call us first so we can walk them through. So in this case, we would have told the person we don't have a jurisdiction over municipal issues. The other two um, were complaints that were forwarded to DHR, the Commissioner of Human Resources, and they, they looked into it and they closed them without findings. Okay. So if I may three complaints for the size of state government mm -hmm. sounds like either one, we're doing an extraordinarily good job um, overall, or two, no one knows about the Ethics Commission and yeah. how, who would I talk to if I did have a complaint? Right. Right, and I think that there's two things going on here. So this year, I changed. We changed how we categorize complaints. So in the past, we categorized complaint, in, what I would call now, complaint inquiries, as complaints in our total numbers. So I think this past year, we had about 12 complaint inquiries, which are people who called, um, interested in making a complaint. We talked through it. In some cases, they weren't related to, you know, they weren't issues that fell under the code of ethics. In other cases, they had complaints that they were planning on going forward with, and then they just didn't. So the number three is, yeah, it's a small number, but those are the numbers where they actually filed an official complaint. And to give you broader context, I think last year we had the executive director of the Rhode Island Ethics Commission, which has a very robust ethics commission. They're very highly ranked nationally, and they also cover all municipalities in Rhode Island. So I think they, they had an average of maybe like 30 complaints. And so Three is a small number, but also putting into context um, that we actually do serve, you know, compared to other ethics commissions, we serve a relatively small population. And yes, there there is, you know, this newness to the ethics commission. And then I also say that people have other vehicles in which they can file complaints, which and I do think in other branches of government, sometimes people are encouraged to file them, file them internally. So we don't actually know how many uh, complaints related to ethics were filed with the judiciary, were filed with the Senate. Um, our house ethics panels or were filed in you know other places. We do get reports back from um, the Attorney General's office related to campaign finance complaints, and we do have um, numbers on complaints filed with the Secretary of State related to um, municipal ethics. So, but in general, in general, we only know about the complaints that come directly to our office first before referral, and not everyone chooses that option. Yeah. Representative Shaw. Yeah. Thanks. I, you mentioned the campaign finance, and I was just reading ahead in your your report. So, does this mean that um, a legislator or a citizen or anybody could could contact you about campaign finance violations, or are we is the normal process to go to the attorney general? How does that how does that work? Because there certainly have been a lot of campaign finance violations in the sense of not filing on time and things like that. And, you know, there's, there's enforcement around it. Correct. And so, you know, to be honest, like the value add in coming to the Ethics Commission, yes, you could come to the Ethics Commission and file a complaint with us, and then we would forward it on to the Attorney General's office, or you can go directly to the Attorney General's office. At this moment in time, I think one reason people don't tend to file complaints with us is because it doesn't, the va the, the add-on value is that we can talk somebody through the complaint um, if they need that assistance. But other than that, it's just going to be referred on to another entity. And so the question then becomes, why not just file directly with the entity? Right. Okay. So that, that makes sense for that. Great. Representative Page? Yes. I don't mean to be disrespectful, okay? But why not just have HR handle all of the ethics issues? Sure. And so, well, HR, so... Because, I mean, you're, you're sending those cases mm -hmm. to HR, yeah. except for, I guess, one to the Attorney General. 
Yeah, well, it, it depends on the type of complaint that we get in, where it goes. But I think the idea is that eventually the Ethics Commission is going to have independent investigatory and enforcement powers, which is the standard and the norm. But Vermont, you know, frankly, is behind the rest of the nation when it comes to our ethics framework. And so the starting point was to get the code of ethics in place and then continue to build it out in the years to come. So is it safe to say that you, you don't just handle <coughs> complaints with it state government employees? There's also public complaints <coughs> and other, right? Um, that right? Yeah, public, so we handle complaints related to pu state of Vermont public servants. So it okay. is related to state government, and that can be employees, but it also can be, you know, volunteer board members and legislators. I mean, would fall into that category. And certain ca other categories of volunteers as well. Say you're a full-time volunteer for the state of Vermont, and you have, you know, certain responsibilities that, you know, you can make an argument that you speak on behalf of the state of Vermont, then you would also be covered by the Code of Ethics. And we put this into place, the old Ethics Commission feels like not that long ago. Yeah, it went into effect July 1st, 2022. So, yeah, so yeah. it's brand new. Yeah, brand new, right. yeah. That's what I thought. Then. Yes. And I guess to go back to your point, why not um, just kind of have HR handle it? Well, the idea is that, you know, to have a real thorough and independent investigation. So right now, you don't want people to be investigating themselves in the sense that it's not a best practice in terms of, you know, getting to the bottom of the issue. People, people to come to us because they want somebody who is removed from their current situation. They already know the channels that they can go through internally, and they don't necessarily feel confident in those channels. So a lot of the complaint inquiries that come to us where people don't move forward, their answer is, well, if it's just going to go back to where I am now, then I know nothing is going to happen. And so that's why they, a lot of people, you know, anecdotally tell us they choose not to move forward. Or you can, you can assume that from the conversation that you've had once they find out that we don't have invest, in, independent investigatory powers, they're like, okay, I'm going to get that over to you, and then they kind of, their, their level of interest drops off and then we never receive the complaint. But it is, a, I think it's the steps where to be able to at some point be able to provide that for this commission. Yes. At some point in the future. Yes. When we get there. Yeah. And it's sort of like... I don't know, I like it, or liken it to, and I could be wrong, sort of where we have sort of the heartburn between when, when you're trying to promote something and regulate it at the same time, there can be conflict of interest yeah. there. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that originally, I know I'm, I'm relatively new, I've only been with the commission for a little over a year, but my understanding was that the commission was originally set up, the idea was that it was going to be an independent commission with investigatory right. powers, and then for some reason it just kind of kept getting put off um, until we got to a point where, you know, the code of ethics itself is new. So, four years, four or five years later. So, brand new. Yeah. Representative Harrison and Representative Page. So, I noticed that you get quite a few complaints about, well, relatively speaking, municipal, mm -hmm. yeah. and you don't have jurisdiction over Correct. municipal. Correct. Should you, or where, I mean, I, I, I can understand where the perception might be easy. You know, you have a small select board, and a project gets approved, and, you know, somehow one of the select board members has some interest in that. I mean, I, it's easy to happen in a small town. but. I mean, do you have any suggestions on how to resolve those other than unelecting somebody? Uh, sure. So I can tell you that the category of calls we get related to municipal ethics fall into two categories. So they're from municipal issue, uh, municipal officials themselves who um, are interested in making a complaint because they feel they see something they feel is happening that they think is wrong, and or they're looking for advice. Um, and so, and the other category of calls we get are from members of the public who feel that something wrong is happening, and they also look for advice. So we cannot officially give anyone advice. We try to informally, you know, kind of walk people through problems. You know, if we say, okay, this is necessarily an ethics issue, or yes, this could be an ethics issue, but we we don't have any place to refer refer those callers to. And so that is a problem. And so it came up um, when we met with the Senate Government Operations Committee a few weeks ago, and they've requested um, language directing the Ethics Commission to come back to the legislature next year with a proposal on how to handle municipal ethics issues. Okay. Okay. Where, where are they handled now? Is there anybody that handles no. municipal ethics? No. Nobody in the state handles municipal ethics. Well, the Secretary of State's office, I think they can provide some services, but they are limited. I don't have a full understanding of what they do. It's, my understanding is mostly what I hear from callers. And then there's the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, right. which yeah. really represent the municipal officials. So if somebody is in a conflict internally where they feel like, you know, one member of a select board 
doesn't feel like something is happening that's correct with the select board, then you know the Vermont League of Cities and Towns represents the select board and not that individual. And that's that's my understanding from you know what I received from callers. I don't have any intimate knowledge of how the Vermont League of Cities and Town operates. Um, but I will say anecdotally, a lot of the calls that we get are for smaller smaller towns where they don't have a lot of resources. And so sometimes people get directed to the city attorney. But my understanding is not every you know city or town has a full-time city attorney that is available to everyone. Sometimes it's somebody that's paid on an hourly basis to review contracts and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, I've learned a little bit about it from some communities that have called me in the past around this happened and that. Like you would think, well, that doesn't seem like there should be a procedure for recourse yes. that found out there's not. Yes, correct. And that's hopefully, and you think next year that you, you're going to um, have a report based on what could possibly be for municipalities? Yes, we're planning on, so we're going to wait and see what exactly what the language um, directing us to come back with a proposal looks like, right. but kind of look look at what's happening nationally and what might work for Vermont. So my understanding just, you know, anecdotally and initially without having done a lot of research is municipal hand ethics being handled at the state level works best in small dates, small states, which does fit Vermont, but at the same time, it's not handled very well in most places, <laughs> generally speaking. So it is something that requires a lot of research and consideration about what model would actually work best for Vermont and what model would meet people's actual needs as well. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, a commission, um, <coughs> is this going to be a long-standing um, group? I mean, a commission generally is for a short period of time. It's permanent, permanent it commission. It will be a permanent. Yes, yes, yes. so, yes. I don't know of any states that have temporary ethics commissions. It's, it's once so they're set up, it's... So change to something else? I mean, I mean, when I hear a commission, I only think of a short period of time to do a study and then disband? Um, well, I think they can take different forms. But I'd say, uh, like, State Ethics Commission is gen tends to be the name, you know, in other states as well, even though they're, they're permanent organizations. And, yeah. and if you do get investigative authority later on, mm -hmm. um, what would your budget futuristically, you know, thinking ahead? Yeah. What would it be compared to now? I mean, honestly, I think that's really difficult to say. I think that um, if the Ethics Commission is somehow involved with municipal ethics, then the next year we'd come back with a budget that reflected that additional workload that would probably require, uh, like right now, we're very small. We have the equivalent of one full-time person. So I, there's me, I'm a part-time executive director, and only recently we've hired um, a part-time executive assistant. And so to take on much additional workload at some point in time, we would have to hire at least one more full-time person. But I think that it's a little, bit, a little bit premature to say what our budget would look like in the future, but it would definitely be tied to the hiring of additional staff. Well, uh, I know that people from the citizens are looking for accountability and places to, to have in process for accountability of their officials. And, and I welcome this work and continue to work, work with government ops and others on this. So, your budget. Yes. Talk to us about your budget this year. Yes. So our budget this year, our budget request is $189,427. And that does um, reflect an increase over past years. And I'll say the majority of the increase is reflected by the fact that we hired an administrative assistant. And that is related to her salary. And it also reflects what our actual costs are in terms of, you know, using... Um, outside uh, independent contractors to cover some of the workload that cannot be covered with the with the manner in which we are currently staffed does not actually cover the, the workload that we have mm -hmm. and that is related to the passage of the code of ethics and an increased not only increased demand for our services but also um, an increase in the amount of work that we can actually do so for example we developed a training which is part of uh, the code of ethics there's a required training that all of state of vermont public servants have to take so we had to develop that training and that was you know we spent money. On, we spent money on that last year, and so going forward, there are more projects like that that require um, the use of outside outside services uh, in consideration of the way that we are currently staffed. Great, and I see that it's a it's a half time position. Yes. Um, and there's no general fund in this. I see that there's no general fund on your crosswalk, right. and it's all coming from other funds. 
It's coming from the Internal Service Fund, and I'm going to let Brenda correct me if I say anything wrong. Internal Service Fund that fills out. Human resource Internal Service Fund. Okay. Everyone pays. Everyone pays. Yes. Everyone pays, yeah. And they did get general fund last year. You want to say for the record who you are so we can. I'm sorry, I'm Brenda Berry. I'm um, Deputy Chief Financial Officer for the Agency of Administration. I handle the finance oh. expert okay. commission. So they did get general fund for a quarter there to start hiring their position. Um, but this year is this year is totally project. Any other questions? Whose budget? Uh, this is Terry, Representative yes. Dolan's budget. So, <coughs> any questions in further uh, developments? One question with regards to this current budget. You mentioned about the training, mm -hmm. and I, I presume that's training associated with the Code of Ethics. Correct. And, and the responsibilities of the three branches of government mm -hmm. regarding the Code of Ethics. Is that correct? Correct. So um, we developed a code of ethics a training on this code of ethics, which is available online. And so it's available through the learning management system um, with DHR. Uh, so we worked on the substantive uh, content for the training, and they worked on the technical side of things. And they also have experts um, on their team um, in terms of like how to develop training, so it's more you know interesting for folks. Um, so that training is available to all state of Vermont public servants. If you don't have access to the learning management system, you can take it through our website as well. But we strongly encourage people to take it through the learning management system. And I presume it's mandatory? Yes. Is that the only type of training program that you envision you would be providing in terms of a, a, a ethics commission? Or are there other opportunities that are we're falling short of in terms of raising awareness, training, to ensure that we have a full but like, comprehensive suite of, uh, of ethics is in the uh, in place? Yes, and correct. So this was our starting point. So before there was no, you know, formalized uh, ethics training um, because we didn't have a code of ethics in place. So it would have been just a very kind of general, general ethics training. Now it's a specific one. And so what we're doing now is logging the requests that we get for advice and the complaints that we get and the issues that they relate to. And in the future, we'll look to making issue specific training. So for example, we get a, a lot of our complaint, a lot of our requests for advice and complaints are related to conflicts of interest. So we can see that's an area where people are concerned about or have questions about. So in the future, we'd be looking to develop, you know, specific trainings related to that, and also as perhaps gifts. So um, those are things that are all on the agenda. Um, you know, right now we do have the issue of time and staffing and what we what we can do. But those are things that we are planning for the future. Yes. Thank you. Oh. Well, you went first. Representative. Yeah. I'm, I'm just curious, if I by chance had received tickets to the Super Bowl yesterday mm -hmm. um, you know, from a friend, mm -hmm. would I come to your commission to ask whether I could accept them? Is that how that would work? You could, if you felt unclear about whether you could accept them, yes. And so, you know, with that analysis, so you're saying it's coming from a friend, and so there's a gift exception that you can accept gifts from, you know, close relatives and genuine bona fide friends. And so you'd want to do the analysis of, like, is this a close friend who you could expect to receive that type of gift from? Or is this, like, a friend where it's, like, it's my neighbor that I see once a year at a barbecue and may have business before the legislature and is offering me these very expensive tickets. And then you're looking at whether that's actually, like, a bona fide gift from a friend or whether something else is happening. Is there currently a limit? Without claiming it, right? Yeah, and so there's actually no process, you know, with the Ethics Commission for, like, gen and generally speaking, for public servants. I mean, you might have different rules for legislators about you have to report, but there are no reporting requirements. But it really depends on the category of gifts. So it's from a close friend or relative. No, there's no limit. If it's from somebody that, you know, maybe you don't know very well, then I think it's a $50, $50 limit per time and then more than $150 per year. No, I'm not going to tell my family that for Christmas presents that it's limited. <laughs> right. If there was a lobbyist giving you Super Bowl tickets, that would be one thing. But if it's your you know, well, cousin. Representative Page would make you feel better. You could re-gift him to one of your friends. On oh, I suppose it's yeah, like, <laughs> She would manage. I can remember like a, a very sweet woman wanted to give me this knit hat and scarf or something when I was out door to door. And I went, no, I, I don't. No, I just can't. I don't know. I don't know. It's probably breaking some rule. I just can't. But <laughs> you had a question, sir. Uh, yes. First of all, are you an attorney? Yes. 
Um, thank you for doing it because you could obviously, as an attorney and your background, you have an ability to kind of sort through things, uh, process them probably a little different than some of us. So thank you for um, stepping up and doing it. Um, you also have uh, an uncanny ability to speak very quickly. Um, my brain doesn't allow me to, to do that. If I tried to do it, the words would get ahead of what I should be saying. So um, anyhow, all good. Thank you for coming. Okay, no problem. It's been a problem since elementary school. My elementary school teacher has told me to speak slower. It just it, hasn't stuck, we have stuck with me yet. Anthea, that is incredible. She can, she's, I, well, I listen to her at half speed so I can take notes. <laughs> just, because when you give somebody 15 minutes, as someone who speaks fast, most of the time, I get it. All right, we'll close out with you, and then we're going to have a break. How do we compare with other states? So we're quite far behind in the sense that the Ethics Commission does not have uh, investigatory powers. We're behind in the, in the sense that the Ethics Commission is quite new, and we're behind in that the Code of Ethics was just implemented. So we are at the beginning <coughs> stages of building out the framework. Um, so that's where we are. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, we're terrible or something. I'm just saying that we are in the early stages of building out the Ethics Framework in Vermont. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You're free to go. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, committee, we are off to 2.30. All right, we have to go off live. We'll see you at 2.30. Who's ever listening? Welcome back to the Vermont House Appropriations Committee. It is Monday, February 13th, 2023, 2.30. And we are um, here blessed to have with us the Department of Liquor and Lottery, Commissioner uh, Knight. And with us also is the liaison from Government Operations Committee, uh, Representative Barong is on Zoom. Both are on Zoom. Your chairs look a little scarce, but glad that you could be with us this way. Um, this budget is Representative Harrison, so if there's any follow-up questions or things, uh, Commissioner, we will, we will funnel them through Representative Harrison so that you don't have to hear from all of us, but we, we do so like to communicate. So we have before us the Department of Liquor and Lotteries 24 budget proposal. We have hard copies and if anybody is, is tuning in, you can also find these documentations online on our webpage. We just had an, an interesting phone or noise that just went off just to make sure we were keeping up with the beat. And it wasn't coming from that side of the table either. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you meant you meant you meant right? You are That's no, a long she, story. So it's just you. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner, you were with us before. I'm trying to think if we should introduce ourselves again. Would you like us to go around and say who we are? <laughs> If it's totally up to you, Madam Chair, I think there are some new members on yes. your committee that I haven't met yet. The, ma the majority of our committee is new and a new room and new staff, and we're just all in a new day. So <laughs> I'll start off and then when we'll finish up with you. I'm, I'm Representative Diane Lanfer. I live in Virgins and I represent Addison 3. I'm Wendy Robinshai from Middlebury. Nice to see you. Pat Brennan from Colchester. Tiff Bloomley from Burlington. We knew one another from House General. <coughs> Tristan Tolino from Brattleboro. Carrie Dolan from Wastefield, and I represent Duxbury, Faston, Moortown, Wastefield, and Warren. Mark Mahali from Callis, and I represent Callis, Plainfield, and Marshfield. Uh, Trevor Squirrel representing Underhill and Jericho. Woody Page from Newport, and to my right, who's not here, is re uh, Representative Rebecca Holcomb from Norwich. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Jim Harrison, Chittenden, Menden, Killington, and Pittsfield. And the other member who is in here is Representative Dickinson from St. Albans. Al Albans. Albans. So, Commissioner, my Thank mouth you. doesn't work always the way I'd like it to. <laughs> you, <laughs> Representative Barong, you might want to introduce yourself. 
Hello, committee. Uh, yes, I'm Representative Matt Byrong. Uh, reside in Virgins and share the Addison Three District with Chair Lanfer. Um, committee liaison for Department of Liquor, Liquor and Lottery today. A couple of other things, but we are here for Commissioner Knight. Go Good ahead, afternoon. Commissioner. Tell Good us afternoon. about. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. I appreciate that. I look forward to seeing you all in person soon. So I have, I'm the commissioner for the Department of Liquor and Lottery. I have been the appointing of authority at the department since July. Uh, I was promoted as commissioner uh, in December and uh, was appointed as deputy commissioner in April of 2021. And then when the former commissioner had retired in July, that's when I became the appointing authority. So it's about, about a year and a half now. Um, uh, of being the appointing authority. I'm pleased to be here today. Lisa Allard is our new finance director. She is also on the Zoom call in case there are any detailed questions you have that I'm not able to answer. Uh, so um, thanks, Lisa, for joining us. Madam Chair, would you like me to give you an overview before we go through the ups and downs? Would that be helpful? That would be terrific. Okay. So the, and that's in your budget presentation. I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of the strategies where, and the initiatives of the department. The first thing to point out is that the FY24 budget recommend that you have before you com is a combination of uh, five different appropriations. So we basically, prior to this budget, the budgets were presented as five different appropriations. You'll recall that in 2018, the legislature agreed to merge the Division of Liquor Control, which used to be its own department, and the Vermont Lottery, which used to be its own department. Um, and while technically we have been one department since 2019, there's been very little evidence of that combined department. We, up until last, um, August ha operated in two different administrative offices and all of our reporting structure signified and reflected two different departments. So uh, when the governor appointed me, he asked as one of my priorities to really integrate the department. And that's what we've spent uh, the last year and a half doing. Um, and so we have are a fully integrated department. So we're not uh, functioning like we used to be, where we have all of the folks on the liquor side reporting up through uh, the commissioner or the deputy commissioner, and then all of the folks on the lottery side reporting up through a deputy. We've completely integrated that. Um, and so all of, we have a senior leadership team and many of the functions have both liquor and lottery personnel reporting up to them, or we have positions that are now combined. So for example, our marketing manager started off being just the marketing manager on the lottery side, we combined that. And so when we start getting into the ups and downs, you'll see a sizable increase for what we call the requ request for, for reclassification because we were integrating the department, expanding some roles. And we saw that on the lottery side, for example, some of the similar positions were paid lower. So we have done a tremendous amount of work in terms of integrating those departments. Um, and that's why you see this year, the extension of that integration is to actually present one budget. There are two different enterprise funds. So we are a department that, and that operates the two different enterprise funds. That's the lottery, Vermont lottery and the division of liquor control. So while we're presenting one appropriation, there's two, two different uh, enterprise funds. So prior to this year, we would have a commissioner's appropriation for the commissioner's office. You would see one for office of compliance and enforcement. You saw one for the where liquor warehouse. You saw one for the liquor administration, and then you saw one for the lottery. It makes no sense to present the, the that way because we're not we don't function that way anymore. So, um, so that's the biggest um, piece to point out. Um, so I have been talking a lot about the integration. So now we basically have three primary operations. That's the commissioner's office, which has a lot of those shared department-wide resources. We have agency operations, and, and that is, again, is liquor and uh, lottery. So we ha contract out with 802 Spirit Stores. Those are our um, liquor 
licensees and um, agent stores. And then we contract on the lottery side with about 590 agents. And so the agent operations are the purchasing uh, of the liquor, the procurement of the lottery tickets, the whole sales function, the retail function. And then on the licensee side, again, that's combined liquor and lottery. And we issue permits and licenses, licenses for liquor, lottery, uh, and tobacco. And so those um, licensee operations are the education enforcement and the permitting. Um, so our number one priority, uh, legislative priority this year is uh, legalized sports betting. So you'll see that uh, in the ups and downs as a decision item that have been moved to a one-time uh, budget because that's what's included in the governor's uh, budget recommend is those one-time funds, which I'll get into. The lottery gaming operations. So the way the lottery works is the lottery industry, you contract with these lottery vendors and they're the ones that operate all of the, you know, the vending machines and the back end reporting. So we had a major conversion this year from our previous vendor to a new vendor. And that basically was a, you know, 10, ten year, it's a 10 year, $150 million contract. So that conversion uh, was a significant um, initiative for the department in terms of all hands on deck, making sure that from the integrity to the security, the tickets, uh, so that went live in um, in the fall. We also uh, launched an online licensing portal. So prior to last summer, if you wanted to get a liquor license or permit, and Matt would know this, and Diane, your your uh, daughter would know this, you literally had to print out an application, mm -hmm. fill it out, and write in a check, which is absurd. You know, so we finally got into the 21st century launched this online licensing portal, and we've significantly improved customer service and the efficiency of operations. It used to take anywhere from six to eight weeks for a license or a permit, and we've cut that down to um, eight days, which is which is quite remarkable. Um, and no, no soon, couldn't be soon enough for our licensees, I think. Um, and there's other pieces to that. There's education and there's compliance. So it's not just licensing. On the marketing side, uh, we really focus on the contribution uh, that the Liquor Control Fund and the Vermont Lottery bring to the v Vermont community. So on the Vermont Lottery, we know that those funds get directed to the Ed Fund. So we talk about like the Educate and Innovate a program that we have a partnership with the Ed Fund, uh, I'm sorry, the Agency of Education. Um, we talk about the benefit to the schools of that money going to the Ed Fund. On the liquor side, we talk about the benefit of the uh, money going into the general fund, and we encourage people to buy local, shop at 802 Spirits. Um, education, we do a lot of education. I think this is kind of new for some folks. They don't realize how much education we do on the liquor side. If you are getting a permit or a licensee in Vermont, you are required to have a, a certification. So you're required to take training of servers and sellers. Um, and we do that obviously for uh, people understanding the dangers of over-serving, proper identification, how to look for um, signs of intoxication, and also carding. We are always giving out carding techniques. Um, we're integrating, as I mentioned, the education data in our online licensing portal so that licensees can access and see their um, certifications and know when the, the, they need to, to be renewed. Um, and then when there's a, you know, a new law or um, something passed, we do a lot of sort of infographics to let not only the public, but then our licensees know of the changes. Um, and the 802 Spirits Retail Operation, we're doing a lot of focus on becoming much more efficient and supporting our licensees, particularly the bars and the restaurants. Um, one of the things that struck me as very odd uh, is that if you were a bar or a restaurant, uh, you basically walk into an 802 Spirit store and you put, purchase your alcohol, much like a walk-in customer. We are a controlled state, so you have to purchase your spirits from an 802 Spirit store. But I always thought that, that was kind of odd. If we're in the business of 
being in the in the business of spirits, which we are, we're the sole uh, distributor, wholesaler, distilled spirits. It feels to me that we we, we really need to be operating much more um, in a business support, business friendly manner. So we're doing a couple of things. One in July, we uh, instituted an on on premise program, sales program with our spirits companies. So we've asked the suppliers. We have international suppliers. We've asked them to identify products that they would like to offer, basically at a discount to the bars and the restaurants, so that we are giving the bars and the restaurants an ability to purchase the spirits at a little bit of a discount. Um, that program's um, doing quite well. I think we've had almost more than $500,000 in sales through that program exclusively. What we're doing is we're getting more suppliers to participate. The average discount is like three or $4 a bottle. We just had a meeting with Gallo Spirits and they've committed to putting 100% of any of their products in Vermont on sale in that program. Um, so if you talk to any of the the bars and restaurants you'll find that that's a really be a benefit to be able to save on their cost of goods um the extension of that program which will be a b2b website that's again meant for the bars and restaurants that will enable them to go online and to search for the spirits they need. So right now, if you are a bar or restaurant, you need a certain type of Amaro for your cocktail menu. You know, you're know, you basically calling around to the 802 spirit stores to see who ha has it. Again, terribly <laughs> inefficient way of operating. So what we're doing is creating a way for people to search the products, see which agency stores the, uh, the products are located in, if there are out of stock products, they can identify substitutions and then they can basically do an online shopping cart, use a credit card, a debit card. That's something we also clarified uh, this year uh, that the use of credit and debit cards is not constitute credit. And then they can have it either delivered through a private service or they're arranged to have it picked up. So we're hoping to launch that this summer and that should uh, be another you know, significant improvement in operations um, for the 802 spirit stores. We've added a number of new products. Of course, you know, one of the complaints that we hear is, oh, you're a control state, you don't have enough product, New York has a lot more. I think it really has to do more with the size of New York or Massachusetts, for example, than uh, us being a control state. But we're working a lot with our partners to our supplier partners to make sure that we get the products that we need, particularly for the cocktail menus. So we've done a lot more in our listing. We do quarterly listing meetings where suppliers come to us with the products they want to list. We actually are doing much more of an outreach where we're going to some of these suppliers and saying, hey, look, we're looking to add more products from craft distillers, not just in Vermont, but around the country. We're adding, looking to add more Amaros, for example, or, or cordials that are um, important for cocktail menus. So we've add, add, added quite a bit of new product. Um, which Commissioner, can I stop you for just a second? Of course. You know, if I'm, if I'm tracking this, you've got 200 new items this year. Is, am I from that new item list and 78 in, of them are Vermont made products, correct? Correct. correct. Nice. nice. Yes. I just having it's I'm just having a, a, a flashback to going to the warehouse many years mm -hmm. ago mm -hmm. and and it it was um, not user friendly for probably anybody and i think there's been some really good upgrades to that but my question really is is do you is there enough space and so that's that for you great segue madam chair because oh, the next okay. topic is warehouse and logistics so the warehouse has existed in basically in intact the way you saw it probably years ago um mm -hmm. there is no expanded space we have a it's about a thirty thousand square house which is tiny we have a lot of product our case load is increased by about five percent so th this w holiday for example we were packed completely packed we have an annex location so bgs yes. has a space around the corner that mostly fish and wildlife or a and r uses so we, we have access to that and then this winter when we were um really full and we didn't have a lot of auto stocks. We had four shipping containers with uh, for storage in in our um, parking lot. I'm happy to say that 
we've made a real push to get the, uh, all the product into the stores as much as we can. We don't have those shipping containers anymore. And BGS is, you know, moved around some space in that annex for us to have. The, the long term, which is really kind of a short term solution, we're actually in conversations with BGS right now to look at a, a, a lease option. And so we're hoping in the next uh, three, three to five years, we will be in a new facility that will not be just the liquor warehouse, but it will be the lottery warehouse and the administrative offices. So right now, our administrative offices, we've co-located space. That was the move that I referenced um, last summer. So the administrative offices are in one building over in Berlin, and we have two different two different suites there. So the idea is to get us combined into a oh. complex that would allow us to grow. We need, you know, probably a hundred thousand. Uh, square foot foot footage. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to allow us to buy more in bulk, and that's going to allow us to save more money. Um, so, so, and now I'm going to ask one other question, and then I'm going to stop talking because no I've um, strategically placed throughout the state. I'm thinking, you know, between the new restaurants, new products, Vermont made that. Um, if, if a bar or restaurant needs to purchase a great, great online, please, thank you. Um, but if they're getting that from the 802 store, there's a lot of handling there that the 802 store space, I'm just wondering if it would behoove us to actually have, and I'm sure you're looking at this, like other spaces for like larger volume to be able to be pulled from instead of at the store. You, you're talking about uh, like so warehouse talking about, space. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, I have asked about it. The logistics of such is that you would have to change the route, right? So right now they load, they deliver, they have a route schedule. The problem with the logistics of is one, you need CDL drivers, right? And so that's a problem because there's a national shortage in CDL drivers. So we we have been talking about logistically making sure that we're certainly more efficient. Um, we work with um, an organization, uh, the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association, and they have a lot of resources. Um, so. A store yeah. doesn't have to unpack it, put it on their shelf to then get the order to have to pack it back up again. It actually comes pre pre ordered for somebody that's gotten it from the warehouse, but just delivered that the 802 store. Yes, yes. So okay. we do the delivery. Right. So the 802 spirits, we pack the trucks, just we like, deliver them to the stores. Right. I just didn't want to have the store have to take it out and process no, it. That just yeah. seems. Yeah, we it and it's all automated, right? So the uh, orders are processed and um, there's par levels, and so then and then we actually physically do the delivery. So our truck drivers okay. go to the stores and unload the product. Sometimes there's pallets, sometimes there are pallet drops, like a bigger store, and sometimes there's a a belt like Pearl Street. So all right. thank you. I just wanted to understand how that worked. Yep, and sometimes the stores will. Um, if they cho choose to, for example, an 802 spirit store in Burlington to get the product out to the bars and the restaurants, they will use a delivery service so that the bars and restaurants don't have to come in. So their bay is in all done. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so staffing, you know, obviously it's a, we are fully staffed the department, um, which is quite unique, I think, for state government. Um, we don't have, when we have vacancies, we're able to fill them. Even in the warehouse, we had two for a period of time and we were able to hire two recent hires on the warehouse side, which helps tremendously. You know, if you're that busy in the warehouse and you're down two people and then you have someone out sick, it just be becomes quite problematic. Um, we are uh, seeing though that the lack of workers in Vermont in general impacts our stores. We have some 802 spirit stores that have had to close, they close early, um, they're not open on Sunday, and we see the same thing with our lottery agents. And so that's just something that we're really keeping an eye on um, because if your store is open, obviously you can't sell lottery tickets or liquor. So we're in the business of selling lottery tickets and liquor. So we really uh, we really want to help the lottery and the liquor agents maintain those hours. Um, and part of that is reevaluating our network on our 802 Spirit side to make sure that we're partnering with locations and business partners 
um, that are, you know, that have the ability to be open and clean the shelves and, you know, really participate in making sure the store looks good and selling product. Um, on the sales end, uh, we saw $100 million in sales revenue on the liquor side, uh, FY22. So we co closed out June with $100 million in sales. That was up 6.5% from the previous year. Um, and we contributed 20.4 million to the general fund on the thank lottery. <laughs> Sorry. I just said, thank you. Oh, okay. You're welcome. <laughs> on the lottery side, we uh, ended the fiscal with 151 million in sales. That was down about 6% from the previous year. And we contributed, um, let's see, about $30 million to the ed fund. Uh, keep in mind that Lottery sales are largely driven by the um, jackpots. If there are high jackpots in Powerball and Mega Millions, you're gonna see a lot of sales. We did, uh, I hope you all read the great news that this uh, yes. first time ever that Vermont had a Powerball yes. jackpot winner that was in Middlebury. Uh, 300. Was me. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Just to let you know, Representative Shy is just hiding her wind, her winnings underneath the chair here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 366 million, and that uh, netted the state. Uh, the share of that was 12 million dollars in taxes plus whatever the state will get from a personal income taxes because that individual was a Vermonter. So, so that was a that was a great. Great boost and excitement for the folks at the lottery department. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, um, Representative, Representative Harrison has a question. Yeah. Um, yeah, Commissioner, just uh, quickly on the lottery end, it used to be at one time instant tickets were a, a big percentage of it. What's the trend on the instant? And if you had to break it into two buckets, the online versus uh, instant, what, what what's the breakdown? So I can get you that. I don't have it right now by product. I can get you the sales um, by product. So there's Powerball, Mega Millions. That's what you're looking for. Insta ticket, fast play. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm, yeah. Just, I'm, I'm interested, especially in the trend on the instant, because uh, that used to be, I mean, before the mega jackpots, the, the, the driver of a lot of the lottery revenue and uh, that to the education fund, but yeah, we're, may we're, not be true today. I, I can get you that. We definitely have that. I do know that the $5 instant ticket is the number one instant ticket sale. Um, you know, we look at the trends a lot to see what's the price point, um, where we're seeing that. So I can follow up for sure and get you that. Thank you. You're welcome. Still too rich for my class. Um, <laughs> Any other questions on some of the overview and the highlights before I get into the ups and downs? I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, did you, anyone have any questions about what I chatted about just now in terms of the overview or the highlights before I get into the ups and downs? Doesn't appear to be. Okay. So looking at the ups and downs, I'll just walk you through it. I mentioned that we're starting with uh, the FY23 appropriation is 13.9 million. Again, that's the five appropriations combined into one, um, representing that fully integrated department. We are looking at a very conservative 1.6% increase. Uh, so the FY24 uh, budget ask is 14.6 million and that represents a 1.6%. A lot of that is because of the integration of the department and sort of centralized uh, fun admin administrative functions. So we're anticipating that we'll continue to reduce cost. Um, if you look at uh, going down that column total number, you'll see 364 for the salary. salary. Mm -hmm. increases and the R RFRs. So that's the uptick in salary pressures. That's 222,000. And then the request for recl reclassifications. I mentioned that we were doing a significant amount of work and reclassifying positions to have the employees be paid more. And this is reflective of what their duties are now. Um, that's reflective of, of a more integrated positions. And it's also reflective of ensuring that 
the, some of the sales agents, for example, on the lottery side were traditionally paid lower. We wanted to bring that up and on par with some of the work that's going on with the liquor sales agents. Oh, just just re, the RFR is the- That is a request for reclassification. Okay. So if you want to, if, if, if someone is doing more work- Oh no, I just didn't know what the initials- Oh were. yeah. Request yeah. for reclassification. Okay. Yeah. So that's the way you are able to ask for a different yep. classification, get those folks paid more money. So yep. that's what we've, we've done is we've spent a significant amount of time um, the last year and a half doing that. Um, so that's the additional 142,000 there. Yep. Um, on the decision items, uh, you look at that. We, this is, this is oh. related to... <laughs> I'm sorry, was there a question? Well, there is, but it, we're going to hold off. Wait, okay. you explain it, and then I have a question. Okay. I'm ready to go on to um, the the uh, the next piece, piece of that. Do you want me to stop? No, I think after this okay. piece. Okay. So I want to bring your attention for a moment to the federal funding column, right? So you'll see your federal funding column under salary yeah. fringe, a negative 88,000. This whole column, basically your federal funding column, you'll see at the bottom that 840, 840, eight, I'm sorry, 184,000. I'm, I'm, I can't talk sometimes either, uh, Madam Chair. So you're, you're in good company. My, my tongue that, is, that is being moved across all the major object codes. That is because that reflects the FDA contract for tobacco compliance. That contract ends in May. We're not renewing that. So that's why you see that um, in the federal funding, that all being moved. Um, just to be clear, we have three other means of tobacco compliance and education. So we do an online tobacco compliance program, and that's an MOU with the health department that's paid through the uh, health department's global commitment funds. We have a state mandated tobacco education, and that's paid through the state tobacco litigation settlement. And then we have a federally required tobacco education, and that's called SINAR. And so those three are sufficient in terms of the tobacco compliance. So we, you won't see the FDA um, funding there. We're not requesting that. Representative Harrison has a question. Yeah, Commissioner, I know we went over this uh, before when we met. Um, and my, my question is quickly, the amount of money you get from the federal government for the SINAR checks, are the costs that you had incurred with the overtime and whatnot doing those checks, was it basically a break even? Or are we going to lose some money because some of those costs were fixed? No, we're not, we're not losing any money. We're just not requesting the FDA funding for the tobacco compliance. So we were paid by the FDA to do that. It was done through overtime. So it was a voluntary program where we would ask the investigators. That's why you see the overtime going away. So the three different ways that we continue to do tobacco compliance are funded in different ways. So there's no money lost to the state because we're not doing the FDA contract. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Representative Bloomley. Yeah, I just wanted a clarification because I had, I had underlined this on the highlights section on the page before where um, it says that you saw a 5% decline in tobacco compliance rates this year which we attribute to worker shortages. Can you just explain that in the context of what you just talked about? Yeah, and I'd have to dig up that report. We send a report to our policy committees, and I think the be best thing for me to do is to send you that report, because then you'll get to see it's the tobacco report that's due to the legislature. So what we saw is uh, in uh, in the the, the signer, not the FDA, uh, the signer. We saw that this past year, which was kind of uh, unusual for us. We had that a five percent decline in uh, tobacco compliance, and again, we are attributing that to 
the agents at the stores, the not having the workers, so perhaps they're not doing uh, uh, checking. Mm -hmm. All the more reason why we think that our just ask for ID um, program that we just launched a couple weeks ago is going to be really helpful. You know, um, we're just guessing that that was the case as to the past year why there was a slight de decrease and people at the stores asking for identification. But why don't we uh, send you uh, that report so you'll have that. That'll give you more detail. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I have the report. Would you like me to share it with the committee assistant? Uh, no, we can do it. Okay. We can send it. Thank you, though. Good. OK, let's take a look at those shaded boxes. <laughs> OK, so the next area is the, uh, the initiative for sports uh, betting. And what we did here is those were originally decision items and we moved them to one time. So you'll see here um, we have for personnel services, we've built in here um, a director of um, sports betting. We have an administrative financial position and then we have contracted services and then the other miscellaneous um, uh, health, et cetera, over time. And then the operating side, we have ADS support um, and that's for operate, you know, reporting and uh, self-exclusion list, et cetera. So that's for the IT component that helps us run the sports betting. Um, the total uh, cost that we estimate for that is $545,000. Um, that'll be the, the one-time ask. And then beyond that, that will be covered by the operating fee uh, built in the sports betting um, program. Great. Representative um, uh, Shai has a question. Yeah. Thanks. So um, if the legislature approves this, you answered one of my questions, which is what happens after this year. Um, but why does it need to be one-time money now? You have a lot of money in these enterprise funds, not all of which go to the education fund or the general fund now. Can it be absorbed in your enterprise funds now? No, we don't have the funding right now in either enterprise fund. The way that uh, we've envisioned this, that would be uh, a, a separate un enterprise fund. Um, so we don't have the startup funds for sports betting, which is why we built them into our FY24 budget. Okay, and so there wasn't a, was there talk of, you're going to create a new enterprise fund for this. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding. Okay. So, uh, because it will be funded separately, right? So, right. Right. it's going to be so. run through the Vermont Department of Liquor and Lottery, and that's my sense it will be a third enterprise fund. Okay. And so, I know because I also have had the cannabis one <laughs> when I had you um, that when you create a special fund, you can temporarily go into deficit knowing that you're going to get funding back uh, on the other side. So you're sort of, it's, it's almost like anticipation, anticipation of, of future receipts. And was that talked about? Uh, I haven't had a conversation about that, no. Uh, we What we did is we built into our budget the cost of starting up sports betting. Right. So. That might be another way we could look we'll at look it look instead at it. of using one-time general fund money. Yeah. As, as soon because your projections would cover, cover the cost of it going forward. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so then we get into moving some things around, uh, right? So we move them from uh, contracted services is our next group. You see the B2B website development there. Yep. 1.3.9. That was from last year. Obviously, we are starting up that. Um, we did an RFP, we're demo doing demos, et cetera. And then we, so now we move that down into the operating fund uh, because it will be an ADS account. So you'll see if you follow yep. that 1.3, you see it represented as a, as a positive down in the operating funds. Um, the same with um, the, uh, but in reverse, you look at the grant for problem gambling, 250,000. We are moving that down into a contracted services so that um, you'll see it in the bottom. 
grants, 250,000, that gets moved up to a positive under pro problem gambling contracted services. Go ahead. Representative okay. Shai's got a question? Uh, a question on the, pro is that, that's an increase in what, that's nope, a budget those, those line both, Nope, these are both fully funded. So there's not an increase, we're just moving a major object. Oh, so you're level funding that line item from past years. We're just moving it, correct. It's 250, uh, we're just was it 250 in FY23? Yes. That's my question. Okay. Yes. So if the legislature approves sports betting, I mean, we, we know, I've read reports about this, that when you increase sports betting, you're going to increase the number of people who have problems with gambling, but I'm not seeing that you're increasing um, your support. support for people who will become problem gamblers. So the law, the legislation, legislature right now, the legislation right now for sports betting has a problem gambling responsible gaming fund. It will be funded by 2.5% of the revenues with a floor of 250. So the way the sports betting uh, language would set up the problem gambling. This right here, this problem gambling is for Vermont lottery only because sports betting is not legal right now, right? So the yeah. only thing you see here is for Vermont lottery. Mm. The legislature envisions allocating money through a percentage of the revenue of the sports betting to be directed towards problem gambling. Okay. And you, and you said 2.5% of revenue for problem gam gambling and capped at no, mm -hmm. not capped, mm -hmm. with a floor mm -hmm. of 250000 That's what's in the bill right now. Okay. And what is your plan for, for supporting people who have a problem gambling? What's the plan for that? Uh, so you, are you talking about on the sports betting, or are you talking about Vermont Lottery? Uh, sports betting. I think Vermont Lottery, you use the Howard Center, and people can make a phone call if they think they have a yeah, problem. Yeah, so what we've been talking about, one of the things that I discovered probably in the fall is that the grant we have for the Howard Center um, should have been done through an RFP and uh, sent out to bid, which is why we moved it to the contracting services. The other thing I discovered is that it's a very um, reactive program. We have been, uh, the contract is for 125,000 a year. We get quarterly um, performance measures with the invoice. And this past quarter, our invoice was 30,000, 31,000. We serviced one person. So what I started to see last fall was, this was a very ineffective way of, um, offering problem gambling resources. It was very reactive. And one of the things we've been talking about is actually we need something that's much more proactive. We need to be doing almost like a public service uh, health campaign. We need to increase the awareness of what does problem gambling look like? What is uh, What are the resources? What are the services? And it has to be a much more of a public education program. So that's what we're doing right now is we're looking at um, not just having it being referral based, but being much more about um, the awareness of it and where to get resources. The other thing is there had been we're we're uh, in conversations with the Department of Mental Health on the sports betting, and I've been talking with the health department last fall when I was looking at redoing the Howard Center grant. I think there's some conversation right now happening about combining those services. So whether or not it's Vermont Lottery or sports betting, those kind of problem gambling, responsible gaming services should be combined, um, which makes a lot of sense from the uh, from the mental health perspective. So. Yeah. I think that we'll see more discussions of that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Great. Um, I just have a, what is the bill number for this? 127, H127. H127. And I know somebody on the screen is a fairly <laughs> responsible sponsor of that bill. We'll figure out how, what its <clears throat> traction is going to be. Yep. So this is one of those items, you know, that's right now that 545 is in the one time in the B1100 section for one time in this. And I think Representative Shea brings a good point that because it's setting up something that literally that could be set up with in, lieu, in anticipation of funds that are coming in. And we have to keep track of to see if it actually 
passes. There's more than, I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner, to take your time, but there's more than just this bill that is in anticipation of actually passing. If I looked at it, there's at least three, if not four bills that are anticipated to actually make it through in our one-time dollars. So all of those might not happen, so. Got it. Yeah, the, not, not in your world, the other worlds, right. but yeah. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so I am now on. Um, the good news is everything comes in here eventually anyway, so we'll, we'll see it, I would hope. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about the, um, if I can find it, uh, let's see, line item that says NABCA grant, yep. this be a special fund. So that is the National Alcohol Beverage Control Association that gives control states grants. We get grants from them pretty much every year. And that is just the spending authority for that grant. Um, we have a sixty thousand grant, to, sixty thousand dollar grant to do direct to consumer um, uh, compliance pilot program. So that's just representing the spending authority for that. Uh, I mentioned when we start to get into uh, interdepartmental transfers. If you go down, you see the drug recognition uh, MOU with VTrans. You see a cannabis control board. Uh, contract and a health department contract. Those represent um, uh, inter interdepartmental transfer funds for uh, spending authority for us to do the work um, of those grants. And I think that kind of covers all of the major items. We've already talked about the grants, we've talked about the operating funds. So we end up with a 1.6% increase for a total of 14.6 million. Thank you. The only, you've got a 1.6% increase, which is, you know, something of unusual from all the other budgets that we've seen. So congratulations. Would you maybe attribute some of that um, minimal increase because of the efficiencies that you've put in place this last year to kind of integrate? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Right. Yeah, it really is that combining of the uh, two different departments into one fully integrated department. Right. And the only other thing is how many staff, like between liquor lottery, warehouse, what, what do we, this? Uh, we have a, in last million. count, we had 72, 72 people. 72 staff. Yeah. All full time? Yes. <laughs> Interesting, you'll find I was actually looking at the very first liquor control board report to the governor, and uh, <laughs> we found it in our moves. We found some archives. So, uh, 1921? 19, no, 1935. <laughs> <laughs> Prohibition was 93, 19, 1933, and then after Prohibition. So, the yeah. very first report. Yeah. We had 11 employees in 1935. So considering the amount of um, how much we've increased, we had a hundred and what did we have for, we had a hundred and twenty seven million, uh, uh, 127,000, 127,000 in sales. <laughs> Pretty crazy that we've, we've only increased uh, not a whole lot in terms of staff is the point I'm making. We're pretty, pretty lean and mean. Well, I gave up alcohol when I took this job, so I'm not helping sales at all. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe I'll play the lottery. All right, any other questions? And this Representative Harrison's budget, and we'll continue to work through him and keep your eye on the sports betting, because that will have a, what happens with that. All right. Oh. On my list is to give you the breakdown of lottery sales and to give you that tobacco compliance report. Anything else? That is all that I had. And um, you can send that to Erin. She'll make sure it gets up to everybody. I will do that. Thank you. And I hope your back feels better. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank Thank you. Care, Bye. Have a good afternoon. Welcome back to the Vermont 
House Appropriations Committee, it is still Monday, February 13th, 2023. We're just coming back in. Oh, we are a little bit late, sorry. Uh, we're gonna hear the budget from the uh, Cannabis Review Board, Control Board, and, um, and their budget. So we'll go around and introduce ourselves because I don't think you were in before. I was here for budget adjustment only. On Zoom. On, On Zoom. Zoom. But I wasn't here in person. All right, well, we'll introduce ourselves because it's good practice. That'd be lovely. I'm <laughs> Representative <laughs> Diane Lane from the From Virginia, and I represent Addison Three, or one of the members. Robin Shai from Middlebury, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Hi, Brandon Colchester. Thank you. <clears throat> Tiff Bloomley, Burlington. Hi. Tristan Tyner, Bradbury. Gary Dillon from Wheatsfield, and I represent Duxbury Fest in Moortown, Wheatsfield, and Warren. Mark Mahali, Callis, Marshfield, and Plainfield. Trevor Squirrel, I'm at Ellen Jericho. Rebecca Holcomb, Sharon Strafford, Norwich, and Thepper. Jim Harrison, Chittenden, Menden, Killington, and Pittsfield. Welcome. Thank you, Director. You can take it away. All right. Thank you so much for introducing yourselves. It's nice to see many of you again. Uh, my name is Bryn Hare. I'm the Executive Director for the Cannabis Control Board, here to talk about our FY24 budget. So I was here several weeks ago to talk about our budget adjustment request, um, and now I'm here to talk about uh, FY24 budget. So I am happy to um, proceed at the committee's will. I thought I would go through our budget roll-up report, unless you would prefer to go through the more detailed crosswalk. Happy to do either. Oh, the um, roll-up report. Got the roll -up. Yes. yes, this is a really nice document. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> you are welcome. Representative Shai, this is your budget, correct? Yes. She likes this. All right. Okay. So I'm going to just hop on through, and if um, there are any questions, please interrupt me, obviously. And I'm happy to answer questions about any other thing. I imagine the committee probably has some questions about other things that are going on with the Cannabis Control Board. So happy to happy to answer whatever you have for me. <clears throat> so starting out with our salaries and wages, um, our 24 recommend is uh, around 1.6 million. Um, this accounts for uh, 23, uh, 23 positions. So the board looks like this. We've got seven uh, compliance team members. We've got five licensing team members. We have a three member admin finance team. We have a general counsel and an executive director. We've got a two member medical cannabis program team. We have a data analyst and then we've got a three member board. So that is um, what is reflected in the FY24 budget. Uh, I, there is um, a request that has gone into the Senate Appropriations Committee for an additional budget adjustment request, and I'm happy to talk about that at any time. That would require three more positions that are not included in this FY24 request, to be clear. And I'm happy to jump into that. At any, if you want to start with that, I'm happy to do that. That did not, it, it's something that's happening over in the Senate, right? Yes. Maybe we should talk about that now Late. before we get into the budget because or, it's. Yeah, are they going to pass, do you think? They have put it into um, the Senate Approps has put it into their version of budget adjustments. All right, well, it's just give us an event. Yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> a highlight on that because I don't want to get it mixed up with what's going on. Just to kind of Mahali clarification is the 23 positions what you'd have if you got the 1.66 million. The 23 positions have already been approved. Okay, so that's yes. the current situation. That's right. And what would it be? What are you asking for for 24? For 24, um, the ask is about $350,000 additionally for staffing. So it would be three staff, three positions. This is in the budget adjustment? In budget adjustment. Oh, I see. But it's shown as 24. So that, so let me back up. It's not, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. So no, it's okay, because there's so many. Um, it's confusing. Yes. So where the, but so there, the positions that we have currently are reflected in this 24 ask. We, I came to this committee with a budget adjustment request and then, um, I came to the Senate appropriations with another budget adjustment request based on an event that happened just as the bill crossed over to the Senate. 
Um, that request was actually a bill that was introduced in the Senate. It was a part of a bill introduced in the Senate to create um, essentially what is a state reference lab or a cannabis quality control lab. So it's uh, an appropriation for equipment for this lab. And then it's three positions that would basically administer the lab. So that was originally proposed as a bill in the Senate. It's S-71. Um, I can talk about a little bit more about why we, why we uh, requested that. Happy to do that now. So I'm just going to go. I'm gonna, yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just trying to understand. So those positions in, in the lab were in this budget no, for next year? They are not in this proposed FY24 budget. Okay. Because um, they, they are. We needed them until we didn't, the AA passed over. We knew we, were, we knew we were asking for it in a piece of legislation, but um, we had a contamination event, essentially, in the yeah. state yeah. that prioritized this. And so we asked, we went to the Senate, and we asked if that could be put in the BAA instead of um, taking the process through with the, with the introduced bill, S-71. So the, so the lab could be up and running sooner so they wouldn't be dealed, so they could test more quickly for contamination. That's right. If, if that um, authority to hire those positions was in BAA and that appropriation was in BAA, it would enable the board to start um, seeking out that equipment and start getting ready to hire this position. So by the time the legislature adjourned um, and we hit fiscal year 24, we would be ready to go with the cannabis quality control lab. What do you do now for the labs? We are paying our licensed labs to run tests for us. Um, so, per, and I, so per test, for example, the event that we had was a pesticide contamination no. event. So per sample, we're paying about $450 per pesticide test okay. we run uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 samples in the last week alone. Um, each it's taking it's about a four to six day turnaround time for us to use our licensee labs to get the results back. Um, and they are prioritizing the cannabis control board out in yeah. front of all of the licensed growers that are trying to get their tests done too. So um, the idea is to have our own uh, lab that we can use which would which would um, reduce the turnaround time for the results quite substantially. And it would also probably be a wash with how much money we're spending paying to our licensed labs to run these tests for us. The director's trying to be very helpful because she knows what's coming and where it's going to fall. So she's yes, trying to prepare us for, for that that we may or may not know. Are you, are you yeah, no, I'm good. good. I'm Representative good. Mahali and Representative Holcomb. I'm still working my way through yeah. this line here. Yeah. So what then, I get the three positions, sort of, um, but what's the $858,000 increase? That's not three positions. That three no, that three. is about 11 positions that were originally um, in our FY23 budget. Those were, I'm sorry, yes, in the, in the prior version, those were under the per diem and other personal services. You can see in line 18. Got it, okay. Um, that they were put, they were coded there because we didn't have the authority for those positions when we were building our budget at that time. Um, the legislature still had to give us the authority to hire those people. So that's how we coded it. And now it's moved up to where it should be, which is salaries and wages and fringe benefits. So that, per diem and other personal services was 1.8 million and now it's just 100,000. That's right. There's other stuff that must be, must have been moved too, right? All of the, that, yes, all of those positions were moved. Were moved yes. Plus other stuff, because that's 858,000. There were, there's, there's a couple of other things that fell into this category that have also gone away. Oh, they've gone, yes. okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I now think I understand. Good. That was my question. <laughs> was the one? Okay. Okay. So what she's saying is watch when we get the BAA back, <laughs> there's a likelihood that this new new information will be included in it. Yes. Which then will be carried forward into 24. That's right. Um, do you think this lab, um, if you had this lab online right now, would it have prevented pesticide contamination in, in an area not too far from where I live? 
Well, um, I don't want to over promise that we would have prevented it outright. Uh, I would say that we are um, still really getting our feet under us. So we had our first um, cannabis sales in October um, and the contamination event um, was really the, was we were, we we're doing quite a bit of forensic testing essentially to find out the source of this contamination event. So I can tell you some of the details about um, how we learned it and our response to it. And, um, and I can tell you how the lab would have helped us. So we had a um, consumer complaint come in a couple of weeks ago about illness after smoking um, some cannabis. We had, um, we were in communication with our lab who did the testing for that product because the product was, uh, we had test results for the product that indicated that it was um, not contaminated. So after a communication with our lab um, revealed that some of the test results from this product that were uh, not associated with the sold product were positive, we started to do some digging. So we're kind of in an active investigation right now um, of what happened uh, with this with this particular cultivator and with, and with the retailers that sold their product. Um, so we're doing, as I mentioned before, I think we've run um, somewhere between 10 and 20 tests last week. We're doing probably double that this week. We're pulling this product from all of the shelves of all of the retailers where it was sold to test that um, and really trying to dig down and find out what, what happened here. So the plan moving forward um, is that if we had a, our own testing lab, we would be doing spot checking, not only of cultivators um, going out and sampling uh, the product that's growing, but also spot testing product that's on the shelves. So um, that's something that we are just getting up and running right now. Um, and if we had our own lab, we would be able to do that more comprehensively. <clears throat> Good, good question, sir. Uh, Go just, ahead. Just another question. With this lab, will you be able to detect outside sources of, of materials that are not regulated by your department? Can you say more about that? Do you mean um, if a product on the shelf is uh, is comes from outside the regulated market, yes. for example? Yes. So we have an inventory tracking system, which um, is being built right now as we speak. We have kind of an interim inventory tracking system, which is essentially a self-reporting system um, through a web form. We are building one that uh, interacts with our Salesforce platform, which is our licensing platform and our product registration platform. So we will have an inventory tracking system that uh, is connected directly to each cultivator. Um, is connected to the retailers, and we will be able to kind of create a web of where something came from and where it is now. So once that system is built and it's expected to go live around the end of April, um, that will help us to, to do exactly what you've proposed. Okay. Thank you. Representative Harrison. So in the BAA, you made a request for positions or for the lab or both? It's lab equipment. It's $850,000 of lab equipment and three positions. So, so it's both. The total of that total of what? The total is a, is if I'm remembering it's about 1.2 million. The 850,000 is a one time expense for okay. the equipment. Okay, so if if that's done when and you going into fiscal year 24 with a lab what would the expected savings of the contracted service be? said you thought maybe it would be a wash um how close to a wash i mean the lab equipment is kind of one time yes but you got the ongoing yes personnel so i'm anticipating that it would be a wash based on the receipts for the lab tests that we have received just right. in the last couple of weeks yep. so i have i can i can give to the committee kind of a um a breakdown of the number of tests that we would need to run just for uh, spot checking versus the number of tests that we would need to run to conduct a, some sort of forensic investigation. This is our first forensic investigation, so um, I, I feel a little bit like we're just now learning how much testing will be required in an event like this. Um, my prediction is that I asked for, I think, $100,000 for a six-month period for the contracts with our labs to run this testing. I think that was an underestimate based on what we have done just in the last couple of weeks. Um, 
given that we want to do both forensic testing and uh, compliance testing to make sure that we are able to. So you think your net budget with the lab will actually go up because you think this is underestimated <laughs> without the lab? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, I just, it, yes. we have to understand. Wait, wait, the, yeah. Yes. Thank you. I didn't understand the question at first. Go ahead. Rep rep yeah. And so just um, to clarify, so the committee also knows um, the money for the cannabis control board comes out of their special fund and uh, a, a portion of the excise tax goes to fund the special fund. So this is not general fund money, except if we're doing something and that is maybe by is that equipment. general fund money, the lab and the, the positions and the equipment, or is that use the excise tax? That's still the special fund. So the um, if we are appropriated the 850,000 yeah. prior to FY24, that would be a general fund transfer, my understanding, because the statute provides that beginning in like Jan on July 1 of FY24, the excise tax revenue flows first into our fund, into the cannabis regulation fund, and then um, whatever is remaining transfers to the general fund. So the positions would not come from general fund. Right. But um, but the lab might come. The lab might. The, yeah. the equipment, right? The equipment. The equipment. Right. The equipment. Yeah. So, uh, but in general, I shouldn't use the word in general. The money for to run this program comes from the special fund, which is the excise tax on the sit on retail sales. And so it's sort of a <clears throat> feedback loop. Everything. Good. Oh, just a silly Good. question. If some, if there are vendors who are have repeated contamination, are they assessed a fine? Yes. Um, so depending on sort of the nature of the event. Uh, it is a category one violation to sell uh, a product that's or to use um, prohibited pesticides, for example. So there are uh, penalties associated with that. And those go into a special fund? Yes. Yep, all of the penalties. So the fee revenue and the penalty revenue all is a part of the special fund. Go ahead. I, I'm just curious, do you have organic materials that um, that our farmers are, are, are growing for your products? So organic, we're Is there not- a difference between organic um, cannabis and just- organic. Cannabis. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> not, not organic. So we're not, we really don't use the word organic because it's like a federal term um, and our cannabis product is not a federal product. It's a state of Vermont product. So um, organic in the, in sort of the traditional sense of what it means um, doesn't apply to Vermont cannabis. However, there it are- It does or does it? Does not, no. Um, because you cannot claim that your product is organic pursuant to the federal definition. Definition is, yeah. yeah. It's federal. Um, you, it, you could get in trouble for that. Um, so, however, um, the we abide by the Agency of Agriculture's pesticide rule, um, which prohibits most pesticides on these products. Um, there's a very limited set of pesticides that one can use on cannabis products. And so our Agency of Agriculture, I think, is quite stringent in this department. Um, so I do think that the cannabis sold in Vermont is going to be very high quality and clean. No pesticides. I can't wait for the next well, question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. No, it's not. I'm done. <laughs> In a few weeks, we'll see how he is. <laughs> I just, I just noticed that Representative Brennan's the only one not in the vest club today. <laughs> No one. Yeah. Best club. Best club. No, we've had an excellent turnout of the best club. Yeah, yeah my brother. Like, I'm not. Huh? <clears throat> That's not for sure. Yeah. Next week. Oh, we did here on Monday. <laughs> did you did you have okay. two weeks? No, I no. Okay. We don't need. Thank you for being anymore. so patient and clear with <laughs> with us, kind of putting. There's a together. learning curve to yeah. this, I think. <laughs> Yeah, I'm happy to talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, I can I can move down now. 
um, to the contracted and third party service line. So um, that 1.6 million for contracted and third party services reflects a portion of our BAA, our original budget adjustment act, ask um, that included $100,000 for appellate officer contracts, um, $30,000 for the NIC fee payment processing. Um, I can talk about, I, I'm happy to talk about any of these, $5,000 for rulemaking, um, and $157,000 for our IT funding gap. Um, and it also includes $1.4 million, which is our estimate for phase two of our IT system. And I have I've touched on our IT system a little bit. I'm happy to elaborate. Um, we have built our licensing portal like at the same time as we've been licensing our cultivators. We have a portion of the our IT system done. Um, we are currently, as I mentioned, building the inventory tracking system. Um, that is in progress. We're also building a product registration system so that we can make sure that every product that is available for retail sale has been vetted um, by the board before it's on the re on the shelves. And phase two is our um, the kind of the second half, which is our compliance and enforcement part of the portal. So it will integrate um, our compliance and enforcement actions into our licensing portal. So our IT project um, is substantial and ongoing, um, and that is phase two of the project, which we hope will be the phase two will be the last phase. Madam Chair? Oh, yes. Go right ahead. Just here it is. So I just want to make sure that I understand here. So in the BAA, um, is what you just said that this 1.6 million dollars includes the 435 that was in the BAA? Yes. It's a portion of it, not all of it. So yes. I'm just one, I, I'm now the BAA asking, we did, but not the new one. Mm, right. But not the Senate. Right. Yeah. Right. So um, is does everybody do that? Um, <clears throat> meaning put the BAA request in FY24 budget Depends. It depends. I mean, yeah, like, if, if it's right. ongoing, is it a one-time? You know, when did it? When did they find out about it versus when the budget was put together? Right. Okay. So, right. I should have known one. I know. Okay. Well, but they're building. They're building their whole. Well, no, I, as, I know. Why? Yes. No, I'm not questioning. Yeah. Right. Hmm. I'm not quite. I just am. It's I'm not, trying to understand. Your budget is just the process. Just understanding. Um, what, not everybody provides this um, spreadsheet in set up in this way with the BAA ask, and then <clears throat> then the budget. At, at any rate, um, it's helpful for me to know. In general, you don't need to answer a question that I have because I, I don't have one. It was really of our chair yeah. and clarifying what you- I can't speak for the administration, but maybe Maria, it would be my assumption that when the governor puts his, his BAA, mm -hmm. okay, he's gonna roll up his idea into 24. Mm -hmm. So we would have to be changed. So there's like, we make changes. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if it's a change that we made, mm -hmm in the process and now was over in the Senate would not be reflected because it wasn't the governor's right. piece. You see what I mean? Yep. So like if, if it was a part of his yes his suggestion, mm -hmm. sometimes you'll see, a, you know, it's like part of BAA mm -hmm. written in there because they're gonna right. make assumptions that it's going through. Yes. Does that help? It does. Okay. okay. But then That's we track it. not only just his stuff that we may take off, Right. But the people coming in are thinking it's in. Mm -hmm. So we go, well, you know, that was, we maybe chose differently. And then as, as the good director has pointed, the Senate will make changes to even our own BAA. No way. Yes, way. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so I'm hoping not to take your time. <clears throat> maybe Wednesday afternoon or so, the Senate will pass the BAA out oh, yeah. or give or take, right? So when that happens, our people will come in and walk us through the changes. Mm -hmm. And then we'll go, oh, that's nice. 
Okay. Or not. Thank you. Does that help? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry if I took us down. No, no. I just okay. no, it's, wanted to make, make nice. sure I was reading these things correctly and in when general. I, so I love the roll up because it's a nice, because you're, you're, you don't have a lot of line and you don't have a lot of money. So it doesn't, it isn't like eight pages long. Um, but on here, though, all of that is on your. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I could have been more clear when I was talking about that line by saying that the ongoing, the ongoing expenses are included there. So the hundred thousand dollars for appellate officer contracts is an ongoing need. We are required by statute to contract with a hearing officer who will oversee um, appeals from final decisions of the board mm -hmm. um, by people who are affected by those decisions. Um, so we have contracted with two hearing officers will probably contract with a couple more and they will oversee those appeals. Um, and so that is an ongoing expense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then that $30,000 NIC expense is also an ongoing expense. That's um, the state vendor for processing the online fee payments. Online, yes, fee payments. So anyone who wants to pay their application fee online, um, we are assessed a, a charge for that. Okay. So all of theirs, great. Representative Brennan, we're going to hear your voice. You are. Uh, uh, could you describe <laughs> what, what an appeal might look like or why? Who would appeal? Would it be a, 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 a license issue or the, you know? Yep, sure, yeah. sure. So yes, um, a final decision of the board so far looks like a denial of a license. So if the board, um, if we receive an application and we find it to be um, not, in we find that the business is not in compliance with statute or rule, we would deny that applicant for a license. That would be considered a final decision of the board for which uh, the applicant would have a right to appeal. Um, also a denial of social equity status. So the board is by statute required to make determinations about um, applicants who have, who are considered social equity applicants. Social equity applicants are entitled to reduced fees um, and also payments from the Cannabis Business Development Fund, which is administered by the Agency of um, Commerce and Community Development. Um, so that would also, a denial of a social equity status would also be grounds for an appeal. So those are, the, those are two examples. Um, there may also in the future be um, appeals of enforcement actions. If the staff recommends an enforcement action, um, a person who's subject to that action could appeal to the board. The board would issue a final decision about that action, um, and then the applicant would have, or the licensee would would have the right to appeal. So you you expect enough? Well, I don't know. You, you're talking about two positions, two. It's yeah. We've we've have two contracts now. Um, we're likely going to try and have a couple more. This is how OPR has hearing. I mean, many state agencies yeah. have hearing officers. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with that. So, um, I think typically agencies keep a number of uh, contractors sort of on. But they retain them to a certain extent, so they can always have a hearing officer available for an appeal that comes up. Okay. So I've got one question on the crosswalk there's um there's a point two six eight three with no description and i'm, I'm not too sure what that <clears throat> is th there maybe it's a mistake it's underneath the fy 23 governors recommend i'm on the <clears throat> the detail report the uh the crosswalk, the crosswalk. is yellow and green and yeah, all those colors. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. You see it? I think it's. I, it's, I guess it's, it's there. It's under. It's it's under fiscal twenty twenty. Yeah, and I don't see a description, so I didn't know. And what's the number? I don't have point two nine zero point two six on page sixteen. Okay. Right in the middle. I'd probably do it. Yeah, we will. In the special <laughs> form. Mm -hmm. Have this weird number. You see it? Oh, I see it. It's there. It's over there too. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yep. We think it's not supposed to be. I don't there. think that is supposed to be there. <laughs> okay. Well, I will make sure that that's not that's supposed to be there. Do you, do you, yeah. Hi. Hi. 
we, we think we've got something here that's not supposed to be there. Not from yours, but we just want to point it out to you. Okay. All right. In the crosswalk. Yeah. yeah. Those it does work. Are, it does work. It really does. They're two. Yeah, they are. Point the two. Page, yeah. yeah, I think it's just. Mm -hmm. They are different. Okay, yeah. We don't know for sure. What the heck? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, what's. Yeah. Interesting. Nonsense. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So I'll keep plugging on. Um, okay. So we're at the per diem and other personal services line. So that's the line where um, the FY23 Governor BAA recommended budget is 1.8, and then it drops down to 103. Um, and that's because that was the cost of the positions, which moved into the appropriate place. Um, that remaining 103 is um, the last position that HR has not created a position for us just yet. So that's why that 103 appears there and not in the salaries and okay. benefits portion. So the 103. Yes. It must be on the, it's on this de the detail detail. Yeah. It's on the roll-up. I'm it's looking at it. Okay. It's got to be in here then. Hmm. Numbers. <clears throat> Where's the 103? Right okay. So where does that come from? It's a position that hasn't moved up to salaries and wages yet. So, you, so it's got to be a combination of a couple lines. It will move, there. yes. Yes. It's a combination of lines on the, yeah, okay. This is like 200, there's a down. It's the, it's the 1 million seven. I can I've never seen this one before, but I don't this one, you know. This, this one, one, the seven, one, the right. one, 1.7. 1. Right, so what that is, mm -hmm. it's this one. Minus that number. Minus that number. That's, that's minus. No, that's the new recommended. So it's down one point seven two. So all these moved up. So this is a. So this is a new. This is a subtraction from here. A down. Yeah. Oh. The the yeah, next. No. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry. No, I'm sorry. That yeah, that number. We're just looking at it. Yeah, that's what moved up to the salaries and wages. Okay. So I'll move on to the operating expenses if that works. No, I'm on the roll-up report um, that I'm looking at. So we've got a little bit of an increase in equipment um, from five thousand to ten thousand, and that is just factoring in the additional positions um, and the equipment that they will need. Um, I think that the IT and telecom the the slight increase there is also reflective of the additional positions. Um, we have uh, that 63, so we've got a big increase in other rental. Um, for those looking at the roll up, it's line 28. So that increased from 4,500 to 63,000. Okay, yeah. Uh, those are the fleet vehicles um, for compliance agents. Um, I think I mentioned we've got a seven member compliance team, and they are all remote. Um, home based, and they travel every almost every day to um, go to do site visits and compliance checks. And obviously, that wasn't there before because we just had our first sales. That's right. That's new. Um, so our property and our let's see, our property rental is just under a hundred thousand. Um, we are at uh, twenty eight. No. 89 Main Street um, in the city center building. We're in the old Green Mountain Care Board space. Um, I understand it's a very expensive space. Uh, this is where BGS has put us, and that is where we are right now. Um, I have, uh, and then the other expenses for supplies and travel. Um, happy to talk about those. We, we typically go annually to a, um, the cannabis the CANRA conference, which is a national association of cannabis regulators. So regulators from every state um, in the country are a part of this organization, um, get together and talk about best practices. So we typically do attend that conference um, every year. Okay. 
So those all roll up to 291. Be a part Madam of Chair. Yes, sir. Sorry. I have, a, I have a question that's irrelevant, but I can't resist. When you go to the conference, what do you discover about the culture of the, your organization versus others? That's a great. I could talk about. It. I could give you an answer to that question that would go on for a long time. Um, it's very different. The Vermont um, cannabis regulatory culture is quite different from that of other states, and I can just tell you briefly that it's mostly because of the, um, our enabling legislation. The way that the legislature crafted this market is quite different from every other state. Um, I, I think I've said this to you before, we have our uh, proportion of small cultivators is the vast majority of our licensed businesses. They are operating, they are growing on a thousand square feet of space or less. Um, that d wouldn't even qualify as a micro business in almost every other state. So um, the, the way that most other cannabis regulatory agencies operate is they've got a handful of major operators that, um, that have <coughs> quite big grows that are satisfying the demands in other states. So I don't want to say it's every state. I know that Massachusetts and um, you know, California, they do have small, and New York is now getting online with micro processors and micro grows. But um, so far, nothing really has compared to what we are doing. So um, it's, quite, it's quite different. And it was by choice. It was intentional. But very intentionally choice to make sure that we have, if I remember the conversation, was so that um, farmers in Vermont who might want to have a part of their, their crop be this, not be, um, I actually want to say, out licensed by somebody coming in and buying, just being a giant production, because there's only so much product that can be produced in a year because you can you can you have to sell in Vermont what's grown in Vermont. So one very large place could end up being the monopoly of it. Right. So what the legislation did is it provided that everybody can only get one of each type of license. So there's no stacking mm -hmm. of like multiple cultivation licenses or retail licenses. So there's really kind of an anti-franchising provision in the enabling legislation. Um, so that's and, and, and we made some statements but through law around what a city or town can when they can say what they can say no to what they can't because it's considered <laughs> agriculture right town so it's it's a little bit separate for the types of type, type you can you have to be able to vote to have it be right. you know, sold in your town but you Please can't say it. no to being grown did you say that it has to be produced here? It does, yes. All cannabis has to be produced within the, it's like we've got an iron curtain around the and border. We didn't run into interstate commerce problems with that. Well, um, no, there are, uh, I, don't, I don't know how well everybody is following what's going on in other states, but the, um, in California, the cannabis regulatory agency just asked the attorney general to weigh in on whether it would be a violation of whether it is a violation of interstate commerce. The AG of California. I know how that will play. <laughs> um, so, Representative Jolin, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I mean, interestingly enough, uh, in Vermont, in Waitsfield, we have two retailers and a. Uh, I think a um, a laboratory. What do you, what's the other license? Oh, a manufacturer. A manufacturer, but yeah. two separate in different locations um, retailers. Which I guess I, in my mind, I had assumed it would be one per municipality. And you can probably see this in other. We do, yes. So I think something interesting that there is an opt-in provision, which um, we opted in, in, but I, I guess that one location didn't necessarily mean one. Yeah, the one, one municipality. The one location rule applies to the licensee. So each licensee can operate out of one location, but a town that's opted in can um, host multiple establishments. And given that opt-in provision, there are some interesting dynamics happening with the, the um, how, re how the retail operations are dispensed across the state. So, for example, Burlington, I think, has eight um, licensed retailers now, and South Burlington has zero um, because they haven't opted in. So I, think, I do think there may be some sort of 
um, density, there may be density of retailers around the state given the opt-in provision. I think we have, well, I think one, you have one, we have one in Middlebury. Yes. For Jens, we have a retail. We have a, I don't remember them all. I used to, and in, in, in November, yeah. I knew them all. They were just starting. <laughs> they were just growing. It was we'll a big deal the first weekend of yeah. October. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing that the enabling legislation did, just to keep answering your question, is that um, there is a requirement that the board prioritize um, people who are coming in from the illicit market. So it was... Right. The intent was really to make sure that the illicit market growers um, could join the regulated market so that, um, so that we didn't keep them out. And that was that's another reason why I think our culture is quite different than other states. That was, again, also by choice. Yes. Because that's all. they weren't going it was in, it would we've incentivized for them to come right. to an open business. Yep. Yep. Anything else you need us to hear? I don't think so. I don't think so. Nothing else from me, unless always happy to answer questions. So your total budget up is up about is one point two million from from last year, right? Right. And it comes from the cannabis fund. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for helping to <coughs> zero. Yes. <laughs> 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 um, it's gonna the eight fifties in there. I think I think the change that was gonna be about the lab. Work. That's not the thing you proved it. It doesn't. But they were gonna <laughs> respond to the no, fact that there was no. two products. Is, that needed to get uh, no. right. So committee, we are still live and I think we can go offline and we'll see you tomorrow at 8.30 in here for um